Here we go. We are live. Okay, let me see something. I'm checking the audio, people. All right, here we go. How is everybody? Is the audio good? Can I get thumbs up in the comments if the audio is good? This is the second life, people. I'm trying to get this all together. Oh, I see. Hey, Sheena. I see so I see the regulars in here. You guys are ready. Okay, I'll just shut up and I'll just get to this. Because I'm excited. Kimmy's excited. We're all excited. So a few things first. Welcome to American Shay. We're live. I'm Brittany King, your host, your girl. You know the gist. If everyone right now can press the like button, is for the algorithm. Also, subscribe, please. So people can see this conversation. This is going to be good. But before um, I bring out our special guest, I want to preface that this is going to be a candid conversation and less of an interview. Um, one major thing that I champion with my work is the notion that there is more than one Black narrative in this country, that there's over 40 million different ones. And if you read my piece, Free Black Thought, I go into depth how dire it is for people to understand in and out of the Black community that there are more than two ways for Black Americans to think. And I also challenge that binary that separates Black people into thinking or outside people in society thinking that there's only two ways for Black people to be, Black liberal or Black conservative, which inevitably pins us against each other and causes a larger divide. But right now I'm seeing this new insurgence of young Black independent voices, including myself, who aren't abiding by these rules anymore, who are being more vocal and less apprehensive by simply thinking for ourselves. One might call it heterodox, one might call it independent, some might not even know what to call us, frankly. But this is why I want to have this candid conversation with Kimmy, this dialogue between us, because she's one of these emerging voices, I believe. And also, I want to make sure people understand, not all heterodox or not all Black independent thinkers, writers, authors, etc. not all of us think alike. We could be polar opposite in thought. And this includes Kimmy and I. You're going to see us disagree. You're going to see us align on some stuff. And that's okay because we're individuals. We have our own journey, our own narrative, and our own way of getting at certain ideas because we have our own minds. So with that said, let's get started. All the way from North Hollywood, California, we're going to bring on Kimmy to the stream. How are you? Hello, Brittany. What's I'm up? <laughs> I'm excited for this. Yes. And we're just going to dive in because I know we, we're going to have a long conversation. Yeah. So so I know that you, you've gone viral recently. Like people have, you've gained some traction. So, I mean, this might be a pointless question to ask, like, oh, tell us about this or this. But some people might not know. Some people might be tuned in from my channel that might not know you yet. Mm -hmm. So I did discover you. Um, I believe it was the CRT video that I saw first. And then I saw other videos, which I thought were really good. And you're very intriguing to me and very unabashed with your perspective. Um, with what's going on with the racial divide right now and racial tension, can you tell us first a little bit about yourself, like a little bio, and then can you tell us why you want to start a YouTube channel? Absolutely. So I am Kimmy. I'm originally from Uganda. I moved to the United States, say like eight years ago, but um, I lived in Uganda till I was about 10, lived in Tanzania and South Africa, all throughout middle school and high school. And then I moved here once I graduated from high school to study, um, to go to college, to go to university. And um, yeah, now I'm in North Hollywood. I've been here for like four or five years. That's and um, uh, what drew me to start my YouTube channel, I actually started my channel nine years ago. So I, I, it started off as just like a platform where I put like my 
uh, my music, sort of do freestyles. My very first video was just like a freestyle on my balcony called the balcony freestyle. <laughs> but mm -hmm. um, I, I just, you know, posted art, skateboarding as well. And then this year in April, I actually have been going through, um, I should say the past year, actually, I've had like a lot of physical illness, like mm -hmm. serious, severe headaches. Um, I've struggled a lot with anxiety, stress, just given everything about COVID. Um, I went to the doctor uh, to try and find a solution, to try and see what we could do, got all sorts of medication, got advice, got supplements, but nothing was taking away like this migraine headache that I had, which was one of the main um, issues. And so I realized that I've been bottling a lot inside. Like I've been so frustrated with the conversation around race that has happened in our country. Um, I've been having ideas and thoughts that contradict those um, mainstream notions. So I was like, screw it. I've tried everything to distress. I've tried everything to get this headache away. Let me just mm -hmm. put, let me make this video while I'm making dinner really quickly and put it out on the internet. So in a way I'm kind of coming out of the closet as like this non-traditional thinker and like probably 30 people are gonna see it and it's fine and we'll just move on. And lo and behold, that opened just like a new chapter of stuff. And this whole like past two months has been unexpected. Wow. So what was your like involvement? Because I know that you talked about that you, you, you said in some video that you were in like the trenches of the woke movement. Like, mm -hmm. what did that look like? Like, what was your mindset? What did that look like? Were you doing like Black Lives Matter? Or were you doing just anti-racism work? Like, what was that? So I, I don't, I'm not even sure when this happened, but it was when I began to uh, learn a lot through different professors in college. And um, I just sort of developed into wokeness. So I can't even say that I chose or that I had a moment where I was like, okay, now I'm going to be woke. Like it just was this pulling away from what I believed in when I was younger and then into this mindset. So at the peak of it, at the height of it, my activism wasn't necessarily on the ground. Um, I was very familiar with like No Justice, No Peace in LA and was kind of familiarizing myself with some of like the shootings that happened. But um, I tried to do my best <laughs> online um, and also through like editing and production. So. Um, unfortunately, it only made me more struggle bus. So it was just horrible. You know, it was mm. just like, I was sick. Again, I just got sick from being too involved in the online space. But um, yeah, No Justice, No Peace was sort of my thing. But I, I'm familiar with the fact that you were, you were involved in BLM. So I'm curious to know, like, what drew you away from BLM? That's the question I get every day of my life. No, I'm kidding. Um, so my answer is like a, it's a two part answer. So first I want to preface when I say this, that I do not regret at all organizing a Black Lives Matter in Columbus, Indiana in 2016. Um, I'm very proud of what we did. Uh, yeah. We, and everyone involved, we raised like $5,000 for Flint, Michigan's water crisis we did charity work, volunteered in the city, um, worked with local chapters. We brought, I believe we did bring a very positive, um, you know, impact to the city when it came to our racial division. And even our, our city is Columbus, Indiana, a very, very conservative town. And 2018, when I left because I went to NYU, they wrote a very nice article a farewell to BLMC because of the impact that we made in that city and that we did challenge wow. that city, but in a good way. And I was, mm -hmm. I was astonished. I was like, wow, like that says something right there. But like I said, I stepped down as leader, um, 2018 to go to NYU, but in 2018, that's when I started questioning the direction of the national BLM, um, and wondering, yeah. is this the right way to champion black lives? First thing that came to mind that I got suspicious of was the objectives used to be very clear and then they started to get way more vague. And then the second thing was when it came to just basic race relations between black, white, and different races of people coming together and talking, it the approach of how the national BLM sort of people said to do it 
didn't make sense. And it was really exclusive mm -hmm. to people. And I was like, how are we going to have gap this racial divide if certain people can't talk yeah. about their perspective? Right, right, right. And just certain things that I used to say out loud, like I, I used to be in that, in that house of being like, you know, only we can talk or go Google it, white people. I used to say it all the time and I'm not going to act like I didn't, but when I started to sit with myself, I was like, this doesn't really make logical sense. This actually doesn't make sense. So I talk mm. more about this on Brett Weinstein's podcast. So I'm not going to belabor the point. I'll just skip right to the moment where I was like dissociated myself. Right. So the catalyst, so there's a lot of other things that happened, but the catalyst was that incident in DC. Did you hear about um, when a bunch of BLM protesters, I say protesters in quotes, cause I don't even know if they were really protesters, but they intimidated diners to say black lives matter. Um, and if you didn't, you're a racist. And if you didn't put up your fist, you're a white supremacist, like all of this stuff. Oh yeah. The, fu the funny thing is most of those protesters weren't black. So in the next, you know, headline the next day when they say, you know, BLM protesters, you know, intimidate diners, no one's going to think, huh, I wonder if they're white. Like, no, they're going to assume they were black. Right. Right. So I was like, if these people really cared about black lives, they would have rethought that whole thing and realized this is going to backfire on the people they say they're allying for that you're advocating for. If you really cared about black lives, you would have never have done that. So I was like, this is just the biggest display of narcissism and moral ego trip. So mm. I was waiting for the national BLM to denounce that. Cause I was like, well, they'll do it. Like I, I was just like, there's no worries. And I feel that. And a week goes by, a week goes by and they didn't do it. And I'm like, don't you realize that this is going to stigmatize the movement more? Like this is going to stigmatize the name even more. And then when I start thinking about it, I was like, you know, it sucks, but I can't attach my work to BLM anymore. Not this national BLM because I do, I care so much about black lives. Yeah. yeah. If an organization I feel deep down really isn't doing much for black lives, then I'm not going to attach it just because they're saying mm -hmm. it on a, a headline. That, that There's other black organizations that are doing real work that I can pour into, you know? Mm -hmm. So I dissociated during that time. And I think that was like officially dissociated 2020. So a year ago. Yeah. Um, I, I did go to BLM like uh, protest, but I came, I went more as a journalist when I was in New York. I didn't like protest. I was just there observing and reporting. Mm -hmm. So I was really up there being objective and just getting the facts of what was going on. Yeah. But one last thing I want to say is why it took so long for me to disassociate was because there are BLM chapters, grassroots, who are actually right now writing letters, articles, one ran in the New York Times, I believe, um, challenging the BLM establishment and saying, mm -hmm. you guys have $90 million, $80 million. Like, why haven't we seen any of this money? Like we have people homeless. We have people we need like for education, for kids, like people are hungry, like all of these things. Where's the, why are you even hoarding it? Like that's, you say you're going to pour into black lives. Why are you not pouring into black lives? Right. Why is it that the attention seems to come when we die? Like, what about us living right now? You know? Yeah. So that's why it took a while because mm -hmm. I know people are really doing work, but you know, it, it, it some things are just not meant to be fought. <laughs> like some things are losing battle. Yeah. And, and that was one of them. So. Oh boy. And you hey. said, and you said you never did be a limb, right? No, 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 no. No. I only just, you know, paid attention at a distance, but I was very, I mean, internally, I was very distraught at the shooting of Philando Castile. Um, and I think that's kind of what drove my sort of virtue signaling online activism. Um, but at the same time, I was emotionally distraught so much. So like, I feel like physical illness is always kind of an indicator of like where I 
I I start to question like was this even correct because I was like from the to the tail end of 2016 that event just like destabilized everything uh in my life um so yeah that 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 was as much as my uh interaction with BLM went mm. but I, I didn't really know much about the chapters I didn't know about the, the LA chapter I just wasn't that aware of it at the time like in 2016 so what is your friends like are you, were your friends very i hate using the word woke i mean there's no other word to use but you know what i mean are were they really into the movement and oh good question um hmm no i would say we were all just generally as college students we were all generally aware of what was happening and in line with um being as helpful as we could be for the cause of like black lives like we were upset at police brutality i was particularly frustrated with um just the pattern about like you know um of of just killing people this one shooting i saw and this i think was more of a no justice no peace um activism issue and this mm-hmm. might have been a bit older than the time i was in the united states but there was this man crossing the street in beverly hills and i just remember It was this quick documentary that my professor was working on about no justice no peace and this man was just like shot uh like dead cold in the street and that's all i saw but it was enough to kind of like infuriate me but no i i don't think i think we were all just flowing like sheep in the same direction so the wokeness was just like everyone was kind of like on board with it um mm-hmm. but to the ex- did i ask people about it did i really talk in depth about it sure we lamented we cried Mm. but it was like it wasn't super um involved it was almost like a superficial empathy in a way um but yeah i wanted to ask you something very interesting um what would you so i didn't really have those conversations right like i didn't really engage with what wokeness was it just was but what would you say you were way more involved i would say and way more um on the ground um what would you say for those people that you met as you were volunteering and who are still kind of trapped in that mindset that critical social justice mindset like would you what would you what would you say to those folks mm. right now yeah i remember you asking that question and you referred to like the mentality as like ultra woke right yes um first i want to say i always preface first i want first i want to say um I think ultra woke mentality falls on both sides. Mhm. I don't personally have friends who are ultra woke. I will say that. Politically though, like most of my friends are liberal or independent. I have conservative friends as well. Mhm. But none of my friends are extremists. Um I haven't lost any friends. But I know what you mean, like me leading a BLM and then like yeah. disassociating. Yeah. I haven't lost any friends because of that. Um mm-hmm. I and and since I've been on this heterodox journey like you have as well like seeing what I'm made of like seeing what my thoughts are made of and vetting it out um and challenging certain things I used to believe I I haven't lost friends um because we became friends on the notion beyond political stance and actually like our political stance is like the least different thing about us if that makes sense like like i believe in jesus christ a lot of mm-hmm. my friends don't believe in god at all like i'm heterosexual a lot of my friends are in the lgbtqia a community um now i will say we have had heated debates we have had heated conversations we have had light dialogue about this mm-hmm. they've really challenged me on what i think i've really challenged them on on what they think But at the end of the day we have the same outlook on friendship so yeah. they they still support me um mm-hmm. and but i will say this for i know what the question you're asking i don't want to imply but were you mm-hmm. saying like ultra woke more so on the left ultra woke more so 
in the sense of the people who would tell the people in DC to raise their fists. You know, <laughs> so anyone you mean, like that? Yeah, like the left kind of like, you know. We don't have to be politicians. Um, just right. No, yeah, <laughs> I, I just want to make sure. Like, I just wanted to, yeah. because I have an answer. Mm -hmm. um, because I know, I know many people who other people might consider them extremists or ultra woke. They might be. I I know a lot of those people mean well. Like some of those people don't mean well. Some of those people are just like completely, you know, taking it overboard, power tripping. But there's people over there that are just doing what they're told because they want to do what's right. And they want to do what is good. Like, yeah, that is really what's happening over there. Yeah, But I would have to say to them, and it would be a question and an answer they would have to like answer honestly within themselves, mm -hmm. is I would ask them, is your behavior championing Black lives? Right. Or is it infantilizing us? Like you have to really ask yourself objectively, yeah. like, is all of this stuff, this, this, these books, this literature, what they're telling me, what they're telling me, what these allyship courses. And when I do it, when I'm doing it, do I feel like I'm championing these people or infantilizing them? Mm -hmm. Do I feel like I'm seeing them as my peer or that I'm their parent? Like mm -hmm. that is what people have to ask themselves, like on a real baseline level. Mm -hmm. And if, and to be honest, if it's hard for you to, to answer, it's probably the answer you don't want it to be. Yeah. And but yeah. once you that's good. Once you become honest though, you can change. Everyone's human. People make mistakes. People we all fall short. Like you can change, but you have to get honest with yourself. Yeah. And you have to be willing to stand up for the lives you're really advocating for, even if it's unpopular. Mm -hmm. like you got to do that so that's what Absolutely. i would say to them because there's some where i'm just like bruh like you're you're out there but you know and they don't want to change like and they know very well what they're doing and then there's other people like just like i'm just gonna read this do this go to this meeting because this is i want to do my part yeah but they're sometimes doing that when you haven't done your own research man you could be doing more harm than good. Mm. Um, but I actually wanted to, this just came to my mind because, and I'm going to ask you about your faith because obviously we have that in common. Yeah. Um, but, and I, I'm asking this because while I'm seeing this new insurgence of black independent voices, some mm. of these independent voices that are, are black Mm -hmm. say that they're now, you know, sorry, I'm looking at the, I need to stop looking at the, comments. but um, <laughs> some, some of these, um, I totally lost my thing. Oh yeah. Some of these independent voices that are black, mm -hmm. they are also detaching themselves away from the identity of blackness. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Do you still identify as being black? Or do you think that's a stumbling block in the journey you're on? I mean, you know, to be very honest, I have not even ever thought of that. Um, I think because, okay, so this is the thing about me and, and it kind of goes into the whole free black thought notion because we're all so different, right? And I, I you know, I do my best to think through everything and hear other voices, listen to your voice and kind of gauge that. But my background is so different. Like I'm tribal, like my background is tribal because I'm half Runyankole and half Chinya Rwanda. And mm. um, my parents, like it's something that not even Americans, like not a lot of people know that those tribes, right? So when I look, like someone can look at me from back home and they can be like, oh, you're probably Muchiga, you're probably Chinya Rwanda, you're probably Runyankole. And it's, it's just sort of like what's in my, I guess you'd call it like physiognomy or like my, my face, my structure. Um, so I, I 
from birth and up till now, I've sort of always seen myself in that tribal, African tribal lens. Um, and, then I, and then in the broader sense, I identify as a Bantu African because um, mm -hmm. I'm from the middle region of Africa in ethnically, right? But black, I think it's, it's fair to <clears throat> still, I'm descriptively, I'm black, you know, I'm mm -hmm. for, for the American eye, I'm a black person and I don't have any, I don't have any issues with that. But if I go to uh, back home, um, I am a specific tribe. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it changes and because it changes, I don't mind whatever anyone wants to call me. If someone is like, oh, you're, you know, an alien, it's, it's fine. Cause that, you're talking about me in relation to what your surroundings are. So yeah, that's that's sort of my philosophy on it. But I'm definitely very thought-wise, like activity-wise. I, I I feel like it's good to get to know who I am and everyone else that you meet. Like I think it is really great for you to get to know people, and not just assume um, their background just by looking at them. Um, mm. I don't know if that was no, clear. No, that's very clear because that's basically kind of my answer. <laughs> In a different way. Um, mm -hmm. So as far as being Black American, it's funny you bring up the ethnic part because that's exactly what I would say. Because mm -hmm. being Black, it's like, or identifying Black, I think there's two identities within that. There's your racial identity and your ethnic identity. Mm -hmm. The racial identity, I don't attach myself to because that's what was done to us without our consent. Like that is what boxed us in there without our say so. Mm -hmm. Our ethnic identity is what happened despite our racial identity. It's the yeah, culture yeah, yeah. you see right now. Like it's our colloquialism, it's our, it's our, you know, music, our food, how we dress, our style, like all of that, what we were able to do in our history, our progression, like all the positive stuff is the ethnic identity for me. Yeah. The racial identity is definitely attached to, you know, uh, racism and prejudice and all of that. Mm -hmm. So I choose to focus on the, the best part of the identity, which is the ethnic one, and mm -hmm. how we've been triumphant despite where we were at. Yeah. Despite yeah, yeah, that yeah, yeah, we yeah. were only meant to ever be slaves in America. And now that we're all here and we have writers and thinkers and we've had a black president, like all this stuff that is pretty remarkable. Mm -hmm. So when I, you know, call myself black or when I wake up and I'm brown, you know, I don't ever, ever feel like a victim. I never feel yeah. like it's a burden to be black ever. If, ever. Any, if anything, this is my biggest flex right here. Because it, it, it is Man. because it shows me I can do anything. And because of everything that was able to be done with my ancestors and people in Jim Crow and all and all that reconstruction era, like they did all that during that time where the odds were really stacked against them. And not to say odds aren't here right now or racial barriers, but when I see one, man, I I I don't let it stop me. I really don't. I'm Come like, on, I yeah. can't, yeah, I can be triumphant over it. So yeah, I identify as black with yeah. my ethnic identity, but I do understand other people who don't identify because they think, and, and, and it's not to say that they're wrong. Cause I've had, I just had a conversation with a woman. I'm not going to shout her out. She's in the comments. You know who you are. She's uh -oh. awesome and amazing. <laughs> and we, we actually, we're going to have, and she's a black woman and well, she's a woman. I'll say that, um, <laughs> she has one, you know, and we had a conversation where we were just going to talk for 30 minutes mm. and we end up talking for two hours. We had to actually be like, okay, let's, let's continue this another time because I was learning so much from her perspective of why yeah. she no longer identifies as black. And it made perfect sense. Wow. And she understood mine, right. And right. two point of views, completely understanding didn't walk away changing their mind on like what they thought, but I understood 1000%. I'm like, that makes 100% yeah. sense of why yeah. I do that, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. But wow. Yeah. I, so yes, I just want to ask that because that came to my mind. Cause I'm like, I, I just want to make sure because if someone doesn't identify as black, I don't want to refer to them as a black, you know, I'm just, you know what I mean? I guess I want to yeah. make sure. Um, so 
Oh, the face. I, oh, go ahead. I, no, you yes. go. You go. I actually, I really wanted to ask you. I'm really curious. Uh -oh. But I, what, so I see a lot of books in your background. And I don't know if I maybe missed a YouTube video, but I was curious, like, you know, you're talking about what led you to sort of embrace the victory of African-Americans. Like, do you have any, like, top oh. book recommendations that led you to really embrace that victory internally? Okay, let me, where's the book? Okay, I'm going to do a stretching right now. Okay. Everyone, <laughs> I'm going to get this book here. Let's see what else. Um, oh, oh, yeah, it's right here. I always have this book on deck. What else? Ooh. Um, you know, oh, I'll just start with these two. And okay. And I might, I might go to another one. Okay. This first book, The Bluest Eye by Toni Morrison. Have you read this book? I've seen that. I haven't read it. I've heard okay. great things. I would, this, this is what got me to w really decide to be a writer mm -hmm. um, because she wrote about colorism in the most painful way, but so true. Yeah. And it's not a triumph necessarily, but she is Oh, like, yeah. that is why she is my number one favorite writer and in the top favorite people of all time. Mm. Um, sadly, she did pass away a few years ago, but this book is what started my writing career when I decided wow. I'm going to be a writer. So yeah, that's that. Cool. Now, people that know me well on this channel know that I always mention a man named James Baldwin. And James is the GOAT. And mm. I would suggest if you, I, okay, there's two books. I suggested one in my last, oh, the story time one. I suggest another book. Here's another mm. book of um, essays. And I would say this really, and actually I'll get into this later and I'll ask you a question about it. But this, one of these um, essays called Letter to My Nephew I've, I've read that essay when I was doing BLM mm. and when it got to a certain point in the essay, I was like, oh, James, you're tripping, dude. Like, I don't know. So I'll explain. Okay. Because you're like, what? <laughs> I'm like, um, what? <laughs> um, so in this essay, Letter to My Nephew, he's writing a letter to his nephew that's like four. Mm -hmm. His nephew's all, also named James. And he's warning him. And this is 1962. He's warning him, this is what's going to happen. This is what you're going to face when you become a black man. When you become, let's say, 16. Um, this is the barriers, the, the prejudice, the race, all this. And he was so transparent, explicit, left nothing on the table. The last couple of paragraphs, he tells his nephew, and you know what you have to do back to people who do this to you. You have to love them anyways and when wow. i read this again when i was well i read this again in at nyu and it read differently because i was in a different spot mm. i was like before during blm i really thought when he was talking about love them anyway i felt it was very like passive but when he said it when i read it again i was like oh no he doesn't mean like love like passive love it's a defiant love mm. like the the scariest thing for hate is love like it's easy for someone to hate you if you give them hate back they they have justification they feel validated they're like that's why i hate you mm -hmm. but if you smile or if you you know give them love or give them grace they'll they don't know what to do yeah and what it does is it makes them reflect on themselves Oh, and be yeah. like, why do I hate this person? Who am I? Then you're just putting guilt on them. I'm going to get in this more. But that is Good. that is why James Baldwin, during the 50s and 60s, when he was writing, he wrote really truthfully about what was happening with Black Americans. He did not. He was not mm -hmm. unabashed with that. But he he lived as if he was, he had all the rights all the time. Like He lived wow. as a free 
black American man that's e he's like, I don't care if the law don't say it, I am. Like, yeah. That was J James. So anything, James, you will not go wrong. Um, Preach. What, that is awesome. It's this. Sunday. <laughs> like, goodness, Come on. Gracious, goodness gracious. You know, the other book is not on my shelf. Uh huh. I'm pretty sure. Uh, hold on. Well, I'll go back. I'll come back. I'll come back because there's so many books. I might be glossing over it. But anyway, <laughs> I'll come back. And then I'm going to okay. ask you that question later. But totally. let's get into the, it's Sunday. Let's get into the faith. Because. <laughs> <laughs> Praise Bless him. your Lord. Yeah. Um, so one major thing that we do have in common is our faith in God. Um, mm -hmm. That's the one, that's one key thing that popped out when I was watching your videos. Mm -hmm. um, you're over there praying, girl. You were like, I pray. I'm like, you better pray. Um, <laughs> and you're very, very outspoken about it. And I, and I love it. How does your faith influence your stance against mainstream, the mainstream racial divide? I guess more specifically, against anti-racism mm -hmm. with the philosophies of like Robin D'Angelo and Kendi. Um, so that's the first question. And the second question is a little more personal and you don't mm -hmm. have to answer it if you don't want to. Okay. Yeah. But um, I was wondering, and I think you touched on it before. Mm -hmm. um, so forgive me, but were you always, um, did you always have this faith? Like, were you always mm -hmm. Christian, born into it, or is this a newfound faith for you? Great questions. Okay, so to the first one, I had a, I, like I said earlier in the, the live stream, I just kind of grew into wokeness. I wasn't very cognizant of, of what it was specifically. Like I learned different concepts, different phrases, different terms, different ideas, and I took them as truth. I was like, this is how the world is. Like, there's no question about it. My professors know everything. So they obviously wouldn't lie to me. So mm -hmm. I just took that on. But then as I was living out, you know, these ideas and seeing the world through them, I noticed that I started to accumulate a lot more offense than had previously been normal. And I just thought this was, you know, you grow up and you become more aware of things and you start taking note of everything. But... Mm -hmm. Um, it reached like this began in 2014 and I would say it peaked in 2018. So just like imagine four years of constantly analyzing the world through a postmodern lens. And I'll get back to postmodernism in the next question. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, in, at the end of four years, kind of realizing that you can't function in a, in a space because I was so fragile, like any microaggression, it was just like the straw that broke the camel's back. Like microaggressions became too sensitive. It was like tiny shards of glass all over my body. Mm. And um, I remember going to this one like community group. I was, I was still going to church in that time. And I literally, I felt like, like I had just hit a wall because everything everyone was doing was racist, even like shifting away from a seat, you know, mm. or mm. a glance that was like, Oh, and looking away, like all those mm -hmm. things, mm -hmm. I interpreted them as like, oh, it's, you know, it's their whiteness and da 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 mm -hmm. And I got home and I was like, something isn't right. Like, I shouldn't be the one going into a Bible study, mm -hmm. literally almost on the verge of breaking and leaving on like broken, like leaving mm -hmm. completely hopeless mm -hmm. and leaving with so much pain. I was like, there has to be something wrong about all of this. So I didn't even like, I didn't really specifically open a specific scripture, but a lot of things came back to my remembrance that I was like, wait, I'm not really supposed to be offended. That was the first thing. Cause I, I remember a scripture that was like, you know, do not take offense, but kind of be merciful with everyone. Another one was treat others better than yourselves. And I was like, you know, this is me personally kind of just talking to God. I was like, mm -hmm. God, I can't treat like white people better than myself. Like mm. they're already racist. Like, why do I need to do that? But it, it just convicted me so much so that I was like, okay, I'm going to start letting everything go, starting with that one Bible study. So I just began to write like the names of people 
everything they did. And from there on, I it expanded to other events and other scenarios. And before you know it, it was just like me questioning what exactly is racism in light of the word, like in, in light of the Bible and in my faith. And does this narrative that I'm being fed match up with what I'm being commanded to do um, through faith? So I just began to journal and forgive. That was a huge one because I was like, Oh, that was, a, that was a huge message about Jesus. He was very much about forgiveness. How could I forget about that? So I also began to apply that. I remembered my time in high school in South Africa and how Nelson Mandela was very much a peacemaker and huge on forgiveness. And that led my journey out for like the next year. And I would say even maybe even more so in 2020. This was like 20, 2018 to 2019 to like the beginning of 2020. Mm -hmm. um, took a long time. But to answer your second question, um, yeah, the post, I, I did grow up, I would say when I was about 14, I really kind of went in with my faith in God and was like, okay, I'm going to be wholly dedicated to following Christ. And uh, in that time during high school, I was very interested by apologetics, which is sort of the, the wrestling with the existence of God and finding a reason against all other reasons why one ought to consider the Christian path. And mm -hmm. in that, in that like apologetic sphere, there is a huge argument against postmodernism and moral relativism, which is that uh, there's sort of, you know, truth is kind of relative to people and your moral standards are relative to people. And I read this book by C.S. Lewis called Mere Christianity that kind of charts out the inconsistencies with some of those worldviews. Um, and that kind of, set me set my faith when I was about 18 but then going to college I ended up embracing those postmodern ideas that I was initially against but then when I found out when I kind of broke out of the woke bubble then I realized like oh I'm still headbutting with postmodernism and it's not really merging into my Christian faith that's what kind of was the boiling point and I was like okay I I'm returning to basics right here mm -hmm. and the difference is night and day. I would say well, it's not just an ideological shift. I now have peace. Like having mm -hmm. forgiven everyone, I'm a more effective advocate for racial justice and unity because inside in my heart and my mind, I'm like at a stable level and even just health wise, like things are way better than they were before. Wow. Um, but yeah, I, I also want to ask you, I, I know I watched your story time. It was really powerful and I, I sensed some sort of similar notes, but I want to hear like, what was your faith journey? And, and, and uh, yeah, like, what was your faith journey? Man, how long we got? Girl, <laughs> I, I, okay. See, I was, I planned, I'm going to, I'm going to tell it, but I planned yeah. on doing um, a video about my journey with how right. God literally saved my life and yeah. saved me from myself because that has a lot to do with how I can do this right now, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. So I'll, I'll say this, um, and I'll try to be quick. My dad, he's a preacher, um, so I grew up in within the Christian faith. He was a preacher at this hometown church that I, I went to, like for 40 years he was. So, you know, the Bible I knew, the Bible stories I knew, you know, Jonah, the like everything. Um, but I will say though, I, I love God. I believed in God, but it was more contingent off of the fact that my parents believe like my mom believes this is what we're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. I didn't really have like an actual relationship with God really. Mm -hmm. Um, but I just knew to believe in him. Like he's the right way to go. That's what I was taught. Mm -hmm. So I'll say around, it was around 19, 20 years old. I started to, you know, party a little bit more. I didn't really have any direction in my life. I was like the antithesis I, as I am right now, like mm -hmm. did not see, um, after high school was like, I'm not going to college. Didn't do college. Um, I was like forced to go to a community college. <laughs> That's a long story. But, um, I was like, you know, no, I'm going to go to New York and I'm going to be like a rock. I don't even know. So I'm like a rock star. I was so out of it. Um, it's just immature. But I started partying and hanging out with a lot of people. And then that started developing into me drinking a lot and a lot and a lot to where around, I'd say it was 22 was when I knew I was an alcoholic. 
Like mm. completely. Mm -hmm. um, and that's when I started, it started to affect my family. Mm -hmm. It started to affect my good, good friends that knew me forever. And they were like, you're not the same person. You're a horrible person. You're an oh, evil wow. person. Um, and I was like, whatever. And I just go out and party and all night partying, worrying everyone all the time. And it wasn't until 24 years old when I stopped drinking. And this was the first time where I made a logical decision that I'm going to just follow God because nothing else has worked. I went to mm. AA, did not work. Went to rehab. Um, I, I went there, but it was a rehab where if you're 18 and above, you don't have to stay. So like my mom was like, please go, please go. I'm like, fine, I'll go. And she's like, mm. just take the assessment. She thought, I think my mom thought if I take the assessment, Mm -hmm. and saw how bad I was, I'd, I'd stay. And the people told me, they're like, you will die. Your body's dependent yes. on this. You will die if you, if you don't stay. Mm -hmm. And I was like, and I was just like, deuces. I did not stay. And things got worse. I got in a horrible car accident, almost sh should have died. That was God right there. I flipped my car, landed in a ditch, dude. Like horrible. Whoa. Um, but at 24, I remember my friend made me go to church and I went there and I heard the sermon and it was like tailor made for me. I was like, this is not a coincidence at all. Mm. And I just remember crying, not like, you know, dramatic cry, just tears coming down. And I was just made in my mind, not emotional decision, a logical one. I was like, I will die. God, I don't want to die. And I'm like, I want to stop drinking, but you have to help me not have withdrawals because I've tried before and I would always get sick. Mm. So I said, I will, I'm surrender. I'm done. I don't want to die before I'm 30. <laughs> like, no. Mm. Um, and so basically what happened was that whole year, that first year, I read the Bible um, every day for eight months until I got through it. And the patience I realized God had for me and the mercy and the grace was so overwhelming. So when I kept thinking, like, I should have died this time, this time, this time, this time, this time. And he never did. And he gave me so much grace and was patient with me. And mm -hmm. love me anyway when I didn't deserve it mm -hmm. at all and forgave me and forgave me and forgave me Wow! that when wow. I went through this heterodox journey, like, of course I carried that with me. I've been, I've been sober for seven years. So wow. I, I've, I've been, thank you. I've been, um, carrying that in my heart. And when I did BLM because of the way we were doing it, I, I didn't feel this conviction like this isn't right. I mean, I did when things got crazy, like during 20, 2018, when things started shifting, it didn't morally align with me. I was like, this stuff does not fit my morals. This makes no sense. So long story short, when I graduated from NYU, got my degree in criticism and cultural reporting, and I started reading people I never thought I'd read listening to people I never thought I would because I realized that I was attached to ideas that weren't mine. Like, I was like, what do I even believe in outside of God? Like, what is going on? Mm -hmm. And God, I do feel like what, like the conversations I had with people that I never would have years ago and the patience I have is not me. I So I make sure people know, like, they're like, you're so patient and you're so and kind and and what I'm like, it isn't me though. I pray yeah, before yeah, every yeah. conversation I have. Wow. Because yeah. I'm like, just help have this be fruitful for the people that need to hear it and help me be able to communicate what I need to say. Yeah. Um, and have my mind clear. But right. that that just remembering how patient God was with me. And how forgiving and how he says that we need to die daily and be like him. Then mm -hmm. that makes me realize that within this racial climate, I have to do that. Mm -hmm. And I 
Sometimes I don't want to trust me. Mm -hmm. There's times where I'm like, God, I'm taking a break today. Like I'm going to write this person back on Twitter. He's like, put it, you know, like put it in, put it in. Like it, it, it's, it's very hard. And I would say people that knew me when I was an alcoholic and, or before they are shocked that I'm this way oh. now because of how I was. And so that's why I want to do that video because I want to make sure people know, like, don't like, don't hype me up. This is not me at all. Like, this is not me. Um, yeah. So that's yeah. my sermon. We gave our sermon, <laughs> but that's my journey. And now I have a true relationship with God and he reveals certain things to me all the time because I really have this faith. That's just like, can't be shaped. Like mm -hmm. my friend, she was like, asked me like, what if, you know, someone like someone discovers like, the Bible's not real. God's not real, whatever. Mm -hmm. Your parents come to you and they're like, you know what? We're wrong. God's not real. Mm -hmm. What would you do? I was like, I'd be like, they're tripping, dude. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, that's not, that's not real. Mm -hmm. um, I, I make this joke so people understand how much, like, I mean that I am a believer in God and that I just know God works because nothing else has worked for me. Like, mm -hmm. you can convince me that I am not black before you can convince me that God's not real. Like I would believe that before I would believe. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Don't right. try me. Right. Right. But right. anyway, <laughs> <laughs> I love that we just went on. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, that's you know? and beautiful. It, I didn't, I, I did not know that was amazing. That's I, well, crazy. I might just take that snippet out and just, that will be the video because. Right. <laughs> why not? Um, I, I do have this question. Yes. Um, let's see where we want to go. Oh, we're almost okay. I'm gonna ask this question first. Okay. And then I guess we will go to the QA if people want to come on. We'll see. Um you talk a lot about, I mean, we we talked about it here. Love and respect, like being the thing that will ultimately help with the racial division. Mm -hmm. why do you think people think this approach is weak do you think they think it's weak or do you think people just don't know how to love people okay great question I think it is a combination of both um I think it's I think they think that it's weak because uh they're uh, very uneducated about different instances of revolution in history and especially in Africa. If you learn about what happened in apartheid um, and what happened post-apartheid, you'd be very cognizant of the theme of unity, forgiveness, and racial reconciliation because the people who invented the Truth and Reconciliation Commission uh, were um, among the many were Nelson, I, Nelson, no, Nelson Mandela was involved uh, in the fight for justice, but Desmond Tutu, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, um, went through this journey of bringing, bringing all the white Africanas who were complicit in the system of apartheid to accountability. So this Truth and Reconciliation Committee was established to bring those who did atrocious things. And I'm not even talking about like, you know, someone didn't sell soda to you. I'm talking about people who mutilated black people just for the fun of it because they could and bringing them to their uh, victims and just having them figure out what happened and then there is like accountability and if they need to go to prison, they go to prison, right? Mm -hmm. In the process of this, something incredibly um, like just unseen was that a lot of the people, especially a lot of the black Africans, the native Africans um, were like, I wanna see the person who murdered my son, because I want to forgive them. And this was, this was in the early 90s, right at the, you know, right as apartheid had broken away. This is fresh pain. This is not 20 years after the incident. And, you know, we're, we're living comfortably and you're like, oh, let me go back to that issue and just forgive the person. No, this is in the heat of it. This is in the thick of it. Um, 
And there were already skirmishes, post-apartheid, skirmishes against the white uh, population that was going to lead to this cyclical revolution of power and struggle and blood, literally in, in the words of Desmond Tutu, was going to be a bloodbath. Like mm -hmm. it, it had already begun and he had to also quench that on the black side. And through this tr Truth and Reconciliation Committee, people like Desmond Tutu came to the conclusion, mind you, Desmond Tutu is someone who has sat in the, president, in the presence of the president, P.W. Bota, who was one of the more staunch apartheid nationalists, like almost Hitler-like. In fact, I mean, when I say Hitler-like, they were sympathizing with the Nazis, like real racist, mm. real white supremacist. Mm. He talked to those people, he dealt with those people he was an archbishop. He wasn't even allowed to vote in his own country. His daughter and his wife were strip searched in such a demeaning way by police. Like these guys are not, they're not just saying this because they want to say this and because it's nice and fluffy. They've been in the thick of it, right? Yeah. Nelson mm. Mandela was in prison for 27 years. Mm. I am 27. He was in prison for the length of my life, wow. right? Mm. And, and he's been fighting since the 50s we're talking decades of trying to overthrow this 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s to the 90s, okay? So you take all of the things that they've been through and you listen to what they've done because they went to places that so many of us could never even imagine going, right? Mm -hmm. Look at Martin, Martin Luther King Jr. in the United States. He confronted that. He was a frontline person in that. Mm -hmm. Why is it that the people who have gone in, Daryl Davis going into the KKK, there is a, a scientific phenomenon where they come out with very similar arguments, which is that the only way to diffuse this thing is through respect and forgiveness. Mm -hmm. this, is not a, this is not a guess conclusion because I made it up in my bedroom. No, this is a scientific um, analysis. This is a scientific result through mm -hmm. observation. You take what's happened in history, you look, you compare, and then you say, it seems as though forgiveness and respect has worked to diffuse racial tensions as opposed to using counter discrimination or the sort of candy like uh, anti-racism. Mm -hmm. It's not something that I made up. In fact, I wanna show you this book, Brittany, if that's okay. Yeah. Please. There's a book that, that Desmond Tutu wrote that's called No Future Without Forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Like what would make people mm -hmm. write that? Mm -hmm. Who have been to the place- And that's a thick book. And it's thick. And you know, it's thick. Like, there's a lot to be said about this. And there's a lot to be said about disrespecting those who have gone before us and right. saying your message is, means nothing to me. It's stupid. It's not going to work. Like exactly. that is the most, to me, that's so racist because you're demeaning such a lifetime of struggle to get to that point. So that's why I have a very, very passionate cry for this because I don't care if you're going to diss me or insult me. It's been done before. It's been proven. And um, I, I really don't have any time for anyone who has to say it's weak. That's one of the most racist, disrespectful things you can say for people like MLK and Nelson Mandela. That is powerful. That is, it's funny because all the examples you use, Daryl Davis, the jazz musician, I was like, yep. That's the number one person I thought about when I was writing this question. I was like, yes. Martin Luther King, yes. And before I give my answer, do you think that people might know that love might be the thing, but it's not the cool thing? Like people are just so into being trendy with stuff that that's what it is. You know, too? I, I thought about that in the middle of last year because I did kind of pose this question to a few people, but they're like, ah, I don't think I'm ready to, you know, do, do all of that. I think there are parts of us that we're still yet to acknowledge the origin of the pain. Um, mm. I believe a lot of people who are still hurting, they're looking at outside events and they're linking past trauma or even generational trauma, whatever that might mean, to those events and saying, my response to this is, is purely in response to what I've seen. But there's something way deeper inside of us. And until we kind of walk through a process of acknowledging so many things personally, even like familiarly, or uh, just like within our own family, and just being like, okay, I want to forgive that. I want to, I want to heal that part of us. We're sort of just these hurt people who want to hurt people because we haven't dealt with our own issues. And so when we see a social justice thing, we kind of are like, 
oh yeah, I want to I want to seek out revenge through that avenue, but it's stemming from something that has nothing to do with race at all. My personal opinion, I'm not a psychologist. I don't know, that's just my personal opinion. But I think we're missing the forgiveness thing because I think once we forgive, <clears throat> then there's the ability to like love because mm. we can't just hold on and be like, oh, I, I don't forgive you and I love you. That it kind of clashes. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm curious to know, like, how, how do you feel about this, this issue? I 100% agree. And mm. years ago, I would have been like, psych, but no, <laughs> I agree 100% because like you said, like, Martha King and, and James Baldwin, Toni Morrison, um, all right. uh, so many people, like all of this archival evidence that these things work. It sounds cliche, but th these things actually work, mm -hmm. should be utilized. And so I actually told this to my mom because mm -hmm. I told my mom that, you know, what's going on right now is not going to serve black people in the end. Yeah. Like, what's going on is is just digging the hole deeper and it seems like agency now but it, it's really not um and so i i told her basically this idea of like forgiving and like holding a mirror to people and like that's what i really believe as as chicken of the soup or soul whatever that book is um <laughs> how how it sounds it's true because that's what i've done in my life with people and not only has it worked and it has saved friendships that I might have let go, like it helped me, like you said, like peace. Yeah. Like Absolutely. just peace within myself that, and I'm not going to lie, like sometimes, you know, um, if something happens, I'm like, you know, not really microaggressions so much more now, but if I'm, fall if I'm followed around, you know, mm -hmm. in a store, yeah, I, I might. You know, it's it's natural to be like, is it because I'm black, or whatever? But now I'm just like, but I can be in the store. Follow me. I ain't gonna steal. Like, okay, and, yes. And I just get, and I think John McWhorter said something about this, which cracked me up. He said that black people, when it comes to these type of things, when you encounter racists and people that even say the N word or whatever, he's like, get cocky. Yeah. Like. Yeah. In a sense, we're not getting their face to be like, yo, not like that. But be like, excuse me? Like, what? Like, and another author said that black anger flatters white power. So mm -hmm. it's like the reaction from us is the power. Hey, if I don't react, on. if I don't react to you calling me the N-word, you just said a word. You, you ain't right. getting nothing from me. You're not getting no emotion from me. Exactly. You don't, you yeah. are trying to own me, bro. You don't own me. I am yeah. not inferior to you Absolutely. at all. So yes. stuff like that has helped. But I want to bring in this scripture because my mom, this is shouts to my mom because she told me mm. like, this is in the Bible, what you're talking mm -hmm. about. I was like, where? Um, <laughs> she said, so she's like Proverbs 25 verse 22. Mm -hmm. And these verses, um, instruct us to heat burning coals on the heads of our, our, our enemies. And I'll explain. I, and you know, I'm sure. If your enemy is hungry, give him food to eat. If he is thirsty, give him water to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. So basically what the scripture is saying, love your enemies, loving your enemies will make them accountable for their actions. Ooh. Like by giving someone kindness in return with their hate that they're giving you, you will cause guilt to rise up in them. And that guilt will force them to see themselves, force that mirror. So in this case, love is complete strategy. Like yeah. people think love is one type of way. Yeah. Like the way you love this person, the way you love this person. No, it's not like Daryl Davis. That was strategy. That was him that being was. a, tro him being a Trojan horse in there, like yeah. in discerning love and I think at this point it's like 300 men walking away from the Ku Klux Klan because wow. of the love that he showed. And it was more so, I believe the heaping coals, the guilt, the fact that we hate a man who loves us, who's not even trying to preach us out of this, who's coming to the, the rallies. He might, mm -hmm. he doesn't agree, obviously, yeah. but he loves us. We do music. He's not judging us. And I'm over here about to do a meeting about how much I hate people that look like him. Does that make sense? Like making them force themselves upon their consciousness yeah. and, and face it. 
And James, and we said James Baldwin, Martin, Martin Luther King did it as mm -hmm. perfectly well. But so yeah, this type of stuff, I'm so glad it was in the, I knew it was a biblical thing. Um, but yeah. it's again, it's not easy. And I think that's what people need to know is yeah. people really thought the nonviolent, or I don't know if people think this now, but I feel like people think like the nonviolent approach um, that Dr. King took was was him being passive and docile. It's natural to fight back, you know? Go yeah. Ahead. I actually wanted to, please excuse, I think my post mail is just right outside. And oh, so get it. if you hear anything, my bad, but oh. I actually just wanted to insert something. And I know um, I haven't actually read the comments, but I'm pretty sure someone's thinking this right now. They're like, what about the American revolution? And what about like, you know, times where you needed to use force? Mm, and I just yeah. wanted to say, um, Nelson Mandela had this problem too. It wasn't, um, it wasn't all a smooth road of, we're only just going to love our way out of this. Like, he, he defined it in this way. He said, the, the, um, the oppressor defines the nature of the struggle. And uh, I think that was a brilliant way of mm -hmm. looking at different ways to combat a certain type of oppression. This was around the time he was, this was back in like maybe the 40s or 50s, 60s, 50s. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, Gandhi had done something similar and he called his process Satyagara which means peace, it's like a, a, a notion of peaceful protesting and being kind of like silent and accepting like all the, you know, whatever happens to you. Um, and he says that it was effective because of the nature of their struggle. But when you, they were fighting apartheid, the nature of their struggle in the 50s was very, it was very different and it required a different approach. And I feel like it's important to say that in our American climate today, I personally don't think um, the nature of our struggle is one that requires our prescriptive, like, Kendian, I don't know what you call those folks. Like, I believe the nature of our struggle right now requires love the most because it was kind of one in a spectrum of many. Mm -hmm. um, and I believe at any level, it should always be love because then you come into this, like, tricky water where people are like, well, what if it's like, you know, like the Nazis or something? Like, what if your oppressor is a Nazi? You just love the Nazis out of Nazism, um, which ideologically, I believe, like internal, like one on one. Yes. Mm -hmm. But yeah. if it's like a whole system of like people are coming to you and shooting you down and killing you, I think it might require something greater. Yeah. But right now in America, do we need to start hating and, and taking up arms and like being like, OK, white people were going after you? Absolutely not. So I just wanted to throw that in there. Like that's also part of like the Nelson Mandela thing, but love is just as strong a weapon as any bullet, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and, like, Dang, that is, that's a quote. It is, and that's facts. It's literally historical facts. Like you're gonna get outcomes similar to a revolution if you love, I, I, I know it's corny, but I, I just felt like I should say that. No, 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 um, none of that's corny at but, all. You know, I, I sense that things are beginning to shift. And I think people are, th there's only so much you can handle as a human being in terms of like being angry, being full of, you know, this like resentment and revenge uh, before you realize that all that you've exerted, like you still can, you, you will never find that peace through revenge. Like, you will keep mm. wanting more and more and more and more and more. And you'll think that you're going to achieve something. And it's just like a tunnel that goes on for eternity. Right. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm curious to know, like, Brittany, like, do you, what do you, how do you see this thing going? Like, do you envision that we are going to, like, how long do you think until people realize that the stuff that we're talking about has some merit to, to it? <laughs> Well, coming off the very optimistic take I had with the scriptures, um, <laughs> I gotta be, I just have to be honest mm -hmm. from the landscape I'm seeing and, um, and I can't just go based on my anecdotal evidence. I can't go based on like, oh, I can have conversations with all these people or well, what I'm seeing just mm -hmm. in the country. Like sometime soon do I see like, a trend of 
tolerance happening or people being like, you know what, let's change the game. Let's start loving. I honestly don't see that happening soon, mm -hmm. to be real. Um, because both sides, and I hate just doing the binary, but both sides want things that will never happen. One, so one side, in regards to, I'll just say in regards to our racial climate, one side believes our racial, our race relations will get better if we just stop talking about it. If we ignore it, just ignore it, it'll get better. The other side believes that we will never really be a progressed country or see progression if we don't end racism. Neither of those things could ever be true or be real, no matter how much you want it. But the thing is, is both sides believe it can happen and both sides think they're right. So with that polarization of the impossibles, I... I didn't realize how much people really thought, like I knew people thought that, but when you're like on YouTube and you're writing about it, you're seeing it and doing journalism and you see that narrative over and over and people like believing, no, we can really end it. Everything in racism we can do. And other people are like, let's just no race talk, absolutely no race talk and everything. I'm like, you really think one side who wants racism to end is just automatically just going to shut up and never talk about race for this side? And does this side think that a side that doesn't want to talk about race is going to join the fight to end racism? It's not going to work. Like things realistically will not change until there is a sense of common ground. And that's cliche to say a common ground where there's a compromise happening. Mm -hmm. And this compromise is not going to be a 50 50 thing. It's yeah. not going to be like 50% of what you think and you think, let's merge it. You know yeah. what? If we really look at what's happening right now and we just get out of our ego and get humble and realize that no one's God, everyone's human, yeah. no one has the full answer, one side might realize, you know what? We need to listen to them or them more. And it might be 70% of this side we're going to take and then 30%. And then yeah. maybe it'll shift in 10 years and then it'll be like, you know what? Now that things are going this way, we need more of this side's outlook on these things. And now we need to shift it 60%, 40 Like if we realize that both of these sides having different point of views aren't necessarily bad. It's like we all have our roles and we all have our, our gears, so to speak, placed mm -hmm. in this machine of this country. And if we can utilize that together and move ahead, but now we just are just trying to go past each other. Like we just are trying to go past each other and leave the other one behind and no one's going anywhere. So wow. we have yeah. to figure it out. Mm. So I'm, I'm, I'm a cynical optimist. <laughs> like I wouldn't be doing this if I didn't have optimism, Yeah. but my, but being cynical brings it to a, a level where I'm not in delusion, where I'm not like, everything's going to be a utopia. No, mm -hmm. no, I, I, I'm realistic on that, but I'm very, I'm optimistic because this country has, ch we've seen it change yeah. century over century over century. It can change. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's, that's how I feel <laughs> like, mm -hmm. but I don't try to be overwhelmed by like, Oh, it's so, I'm just like, just do your part because everyone before you did their part and look how, look at what you are able to enjoy. Do your yeah. part for the next generation so they can enjoy a life better than you. That's all you can do. Um, I'm curious, what what do you feel? Like, are you hopefully more optimistic? So we, I, I would say I'm kind of unrealistically optimistic. <laughs> so I- I, I love that. I was like, I'm not optimistic. <laughs> I kind of have this like unusual, I would say, I don't, I, have you read Tipping Point by Malcolm Gladwell by any chance? The Tipping Point? I have, you know, I, I read this. I saw Did, you post that. I love I, that book. David Some and Goliath. David yeah. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, and I read his book Outliers, but I need to read Tipping Point clearly. Okay. So Tipping Point talks about, um, there's a point before he, he uses this graph. Let me try to put my fingers on the camera. He uses this graph where it's kind of this exponential growth. And then like there, there's like the slow decline. And he describes this, I think it, it's in four kind of 
sets of transition of like a trend or an idea or a certain thing that happens. And if anyone knows those specific terms, I know one of them is like an innovator and then there's like a, an early adopter is what happens next. And then there's, there's laggers who follow a trend late once it's like in the mainstream. If we're using fashion, for example, let me, this is something he used in the book. If you see, I'll just use a, ra a random fashion example. Okay. Everyone's wearing like Birkenstocks right now, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it's just such a common thing. And, and it's like an H&M, it's an urban outfit, like wherever you go, they're like trying to sell these like Crocs or like Birkenstock Crocs. Mm -hmm. And um, because it's so common now, and we're kind of these people like me, because <laughs> I'm fashionably late in, in the wrong <laughs> sense, not the right figure to term. Um, I'll be looking for the Birkenstocks, but then there's someone out there right now who's wearing like Tim's that were like fashionable in 2000. And they're, they're the one person who's doing the awkward thing that no one really mm. is like, you're like Tim's in like the Birkenstock age. Like, I don't know about that. So I feel like, so not that I feel like, but according to Malcolm Gladwell, that person starts something where people are like, wait, that's kind of a vibe. Like everyone's got Birkenstocks right now. Like, mm -hmm. let me let me investigate what's going on with this like Timberland sensation. And so then there would be the early adopter. So the person wearing the Tims is the innovator. And then the next one is the early adopter where people are like, you know what? Tims are kind of looking like unique right now. I'm just going to like rock them. And before you know it, you have a tipping point where Tims kind of become the in thing where it's mm. like, it's a little bit unique to wear Tims. So I'm going to wear Tim's while I'm ahead of the trend and kind of mm. stand out from the Birkenstock crowd. Mm -hmm. And eventually what you have is people realizing the Birkenstocks are like so last year and like Tim's are like so, you know. And so it's like people just hop on that train and now you have H&M selling Tim's and now you have about Forever 21. I think it's called Forever 21 these days. But mm -hmm. basically how I feel like within the next three months, we're be going to begin to see, um, what would you call it? Uh, people kind of attached to the early adoption of free black thought. I feel like mm -hmm. they're gonna see it kind of catch on. People are kind of like, I think it's okay to say that I don't agree with everything. And then more people get emboldened, but then there's gonna be like a tipping point where it's just, woo, everyone mm -hmm. is I like- I hope I'm there for that. Right, it's like kind of last year to be, narrow-minded if for lack of a better word and it's kind of like the trend to be independent that's just my opinion assumption to, to be honest yeah. i don't think you're off <laughs> i think i i don't know do you think the pandemic has any influence on this that people oh. were sitting with themselves oh. and being like do, do why am i fighting <laughs> like right. i absolutely absolutely um pandemic had a lot of things to do with with people becoming super um, concerned about social justice. I think the isolation played a role in that and our human like response, compassionate response and our empathetic response was sort of heightened by, by that. That's just my personal, like again, assumption, uh, not educated at all. But I think it will have a lot to do with people wondering like, wait, am I actually doing anything with this? Like, is it effective? What is the change that I wanna see? Like, do I need to be the change I need to see? I mm -hmm. think that's also gonna kind of Mm. hop on that that thing I mm -hmm. guess I, I agree and I hope and also before we end this um, conversation real quick um, dang it I lost it I knew I was going to lose the dang question because it came up oh, no. after your last comment hold on hold on if no I don't way. get it this is live people okay this happens to <laughs> me they edit this out of the podcast when I lose my thought um oh, no. mm, you know what? Let's bring Lee on. And if I and if I Lee. if I uh, think about it, then we will. Okay. So mm -hmm. everyone, we're bringing Lee on. Um, if you don't know who Lee is, you guys probably have seen him and I talk at least twice. We had podcasts on American Shade where we talk candidly. Um, Lee, do you want to introduce yourself a little bit, or you want me to do it? Oh, you can. It's fine. Okay, well, Lee is a white engineer. <laughs> That's how he was titled in the last thing. Um, and Lee was actually someone that I met because of Black Lives Matter in Columbus. And he started um, being involved in 2016 up until 2018. And we stayed friends. And now we've had 
very fruitful conversations about how we feel about, you know, racial tension and how we feel about things and what things looked like back then to now. Um, and he's like one person out of many. I have other people I can talk to, but he's definitely one person where I can say anything to, like anything to, and he can say any question or anything to me. And we don't get offended because we just consent. Like, this is our friendship. You can just say it. Um, but Lee is here because I would ask him to look at the comments to see if he saw any questions, to see if there are super chats. Lee, there's, is there any questions? Go ahead. There's so much in that chat. I was trying to follow YouTube, which has been great to listen to, but it's hard to do at times with following the chat has been nuts. And there are some of these super things, but I don't know what they are. Oh gosh, Lee. There so, are two Lee is right also now. not 20. Years yeah, there's two old. right now. That's exactly right. Um, okay, so this is a question. Oh, how do you okay guys? Sorry, I I am 31, but I am like no, I'm grandma when it comes to this stuff. So I'm <laughs> going to if someone wants to come on with live with us and you want to give a comment or if you want to give um a question to us, you can. I'm about to put this in the description right now. I'm copying and pasting it. So what you have to do is if you've been watching this live for a while, you're going to have to refresh your computer to see the link. And it will be in the description box. Give it a second. Hold on. Okay, right now. And the thing is, is only three people can come on because this link only works for three people. So if you see it, do it. And while we wait, Lee, was there anything that popped out to you about our, our conversation? Well, I got a couple of book titles I want to read. But, you know, it was interesting. It was very interesting. Um, I was trying to simultaneously, you know, multitask the, the chat, which was a lot of different stuff all over the place with lots of different things uh, to the same thing you guys were saying. And a lot of times it had nothing to do with what you guys were saying in the chat, which made it really hard to to keep the two things in you know parallel lined Lee, up. Because Lee is calling really you hard. guys out. Clearly. Well, I, I mean, it's I don't I don't watch these things all the time, so maybe they're always like this. I don't know. In fact, somebody commented to it that some of the comments have almost nothing to do with the uh, the conversation. That's I'm so, so glad people are paying attention. Um, let's see. Yeah, that's what Chris Lee says. I honestly don't think people were listening oh, or just having their Chris... own debate. And I think that might have been true. <laughs> it, it, it <laughs> okay, what, what like were you debate. having your debate on? I'm so curious. There were so many things. Oh, there, I, I don't know if I can even recant them all off the top can, of my head. There can was... someone come on the live right now and tell us what this debate Post, was? Postmodernism, um, diversity of thought. Um, geez, there, there's probably 20 of these things. Um, that, that that were really a lot of a lot of different just a lot of different things. Um, I'm kind of scrolling and looking now too. Um. Okay. Yes, I would. Oh no, he's talking. See, I'm over here looking at the comments, like trying to see. Thank you for the super chat. I think it says Alexandria Martin. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um. I'm trying to go through this. I mean, if no one wants to come on this live and talk to us, it's fine, but. Come on the live. Come on the live. Oh, wait, questions. someone's here. Hold on. Ooh. Oh. We have someone here. And what's his name? Oh, I don't know his name. Is that Z Counts? Okay, I don't. We're going to hope that this goes well. <laughs> Hello. Hi. How's it going? How are you? Hi, Z Counts. Unfortunately, I wasn't paying attention to the chat. I was listening to what y'all were saying. So oh, I have a specific question. <laughs> but, Thank um, you. Yeah. So y'all talked about like love and compassion and gave the examples of like Daryl, uh, Desmond Tutu, MLK. Um, from my perspective, uh, I grew up in the South. I was born in Texas and grew up in Arkansas. So mm -hmm. like it feels like the barrier to that is a lot of fear. You know what I'm saying? Of like, I don't know like demonization almost like not having any contact with it so you have no idea what it is so you build up this like you know mm. what i'm saying mm. uh, imaginary character in your head or something so i was just wondering if what y'all thought of fear in general and how to like counteract that i get that i think it's i think the answer is love but i just wanted to hear y'all's kind of like 
mm. um, thoughts on fear and how to like actually combat that. Wow. Practically. Well, Brittany, go ahead. I'll, I'll go ahead. And I mean, Lee, I'm going to bring up you. So one thing about Lee and I, we're, we're close and we talk about everything. And like, I just gave a whole sermon about my faith, but Lee is, you're fine with me saying it, Lee. Like he's sure. atheist. Um, yeah, I'm a, I'm a definitely a non-believer yeah, of, so, of many religions. Yeah. So I, I don't believe in any of the religions you don't believe plus one more is how I like to say it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so basically this will be an interesting conversation. Um, like an interesting answer for you. I'll give mine and then we can all give ours and then Lee will have a different perspective. Mine will be a Christian take. I mean, God has not given us the spirit of fear. That's what I constantly say to me. Fear is, how would you define fear actually? I don't want to, how would you define that type of fear that I, you're sensing? I think it's just um, like, especially from a conservative place, it feels like a lot of the conservative values are built on order. And so I think it just feels like some, just something they don't know. You know Ooh. what I'm saying? And so that feels like fearful, mm -hmm. whatever that is. Fearful and so it, of the unknown. Mm. Yeah. I love that. Mm. Um, Brittany, do you, you can go ahead, Kimmy. Okay. I just wanted to say, I, that is such a good point, first of all. Um, I think there is that element of like chaos and, you know, everything's in order at home, in our neighborhood, in our society. But there's like, what is that thing that exists beyond our realm? And there is a fear of like, I don't want to encounter whatever that is because I don't know what's going to happen to me. In my experience, actually through skateboarding, I feel like that's where I rapidly came out of my ultra like woke mentality because I went in thinking, this is what skaters are like. They're the most horrible, like they're gonna be so disrespectful. They're gonna be mean. They're gonna spit on you. Like literally these are the expectations I went yeah. in with. But, and it was a fear. It was this like unknown thing, but I was like, you know what? Let me just brave it because I really wanna skate and there's only a quarter pipe here. So I would go in and you know, getting to know people, talking to people, saying like, hey, like clapping your board when someone does a great trick first of all, allowed me to realize like, oh, they're, they're, just, they're humans. Like, they're not evil. They're not out to like kill me or slash my tires. Like they really are just there to skate. And if you come in with a sort of peaceful demeanor, then they're like, oh, you're also human. Like, you're also just chill. Like you just want to skate. Like, and so we break that fear and the, the fear of the unknown because we're getting to know each other, right? Mm -hmm. So I think it's important for First of all, Hollywood representation, I think, builds a lot of that, like, oh, my goodness, like, is this what black people are like? This is just my assumption, right? Again, I'm not educated, but um, I think Hollywood representation does a lot to egg on that fear. But I think once we kind of are, decide on ourselves, like, you know what, I want to go meet a black family. Like, I want to go meet people that I've never interacted with. That is that that breaking of that fear, breaking of that chaos. And then you're beginning to have first world, not first world, first hand experience and first hand knowledge on what is really going on. So that's that's yeah. what you want it. Mm -hmm. That's ex I mean, that's basically what I'd say. I think on an interpersonal level, it seems like this overwhelming sense of fear. Like it's just like, what's the point to even try? But on an interpersonal level, like Kimmy said, like most people are fearful. You're not the only one. Mm -hmm. So knowing that, and also I mentioned this in the Brad Weinstein um, podcast that we're all walking around with these weapons of protecting ourselves, but they're heavy. Like we don't want to carry this, but we just don't know. If, are you going to swing at us? Mm -hmm. And like Kimmy said, if you go into those rooms and talk to people that think you're their enemy and realize and make them see that you're not, then you do a ripple effect and then maybe they'll do that to someone else and someone else and someone else. And yeah. then that tears it down. But I don't think it's a one swipe thing. I think it's like a little thing nudging mm -hmm. it little by little is how you get, you get to it. Yeah. So hopefully that helps. Yeah. Lee, do you have a take? I'm, I mean, I think fear is part of our survival. <laughs> so it, it, mm -hmm. it goes way back in my opinion. And of course you can fear all kinds of different things and, 
you know, I think it's different for everybody what they fear. I think like Kimmy said, is true. Hollywood has probably crafted for, you know, you know, what, what different things, you know, what it's like in, in, in the hood, let's say, mm-hmm. if you've never been in the hood, mm. then, then you only have, you know, what, what you've seen in, in um, television, you know, mm-hmm. what else or movies, same really movies, I guess, because that's mm-hmm. so much harsher than TV is as yeah. far as what they're allowed to put in that art form. You know what I mean? And um, I, I just don't think that um, you, you almost can't blame people for thinking what they think when it's been, you know, th- their mind has been shaped by things that are outside their control. Yeah. In my, in my opinion, I, I really do think that's, that's, that's the case. And, and it's for everybody about everything. It, you know, I really think it goes all the way back to the very beginning of your birth and what you're exposed to with your parents and, and, and where you happen to grow up and mm-hmm. all that stuff. And you don't control any of that stuff. It's, it's, it, it, it really controls you in a way, you know, yeah. I mean, it, 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 kind of unconsciously, I'm not saying it controls your outward things, but it does control your inner things in a way. And, and you, you know, how do you, um, how do you get around that? You know, it's, it can be hard depending, you know, mm-hmm. when you yeah. don't have anything else to go on. Right. So, so just mm-hmm. put yourself out mm-hmm. there. Yeah. And, I, yeah. I, I very much heard bravery as like a, yeah. A bringing, like, oh, term. absolutely. 100%. Z, I have a question for you, mm-hmm. kind of unrelated. First of all, what is your name and where are you from? And are you an artist? And did you paint that stuff behind you? Because that looks awesome. Thank you. <laughs> um, my name's Zach Counts, so that's just why I Counts. But Got uh, you. And I'm from Texas originally, and uh, mm-hmm. I grew up in Arkansas, so and lived uh, in, in Florida. Uh, yeah. So, mm-hmm. uh, yes, I painted those. Uh, I'm very obsessed with like painting and stuff, but. Um, wow. I'm super, uh, one thing I want to not push back on, but add, add some perspective to maybe what those people are thinking is that part of a problem in the South, I feel like is the um, lingering effects of Jim Crow. So a lot mm-hmm. of, a lot of communities are broke up in ways that are like, like for instance, uh, Pine Bluff in Arkansas is like, murder capital of the uh, country at one point you know what i'm saying little rock's been murder capital of the country at one point too so it's like both in arkansas so like those are places you are scared to go you know what Mm -hmm. i'm saying like rightfully so and most of those people that were put there are like their skin cones black you know what i'm saying and so it it it's i feel like it's like daryl going into the kkk where it's like there's a potential that you could get like those people feel like there is a legit potential that they could be hurt why would a someone with black skin not want to go to the KKK because they could get hurt. And like, I see that as a reasonable thing. Like, mm-hmm. I, so yeah. I, I don't necessarily push back that it's Hollywood. I just think that like a lot of these people, there is like a, a material to it, I guess is like wow, the, yeah. of the fear is that they are separated. So it's almost like nationalities of like two different things sitting next to each other. So, mm. And that's, that's why I was super interested in your context around Desmond Tutu and like the apartheid and everything. Cause that's something I've looked into history too, because of like just trying to get context, all the stuff that's going on in the South and everything. Yeah, that's so valid and so true. Um, and yeah, it's, it's very, uh, Brittany or Lee, I don't know if you said it, but like fear is a very much so, it's very real and it's it, to our benefit at times because we're like, I don't sure. want to go and get like hurt or abused, you know, if this area is known to do that. Um, Right. But yeah, but yeah, it's it's tricky, and it's definitely a very like, you know, what's happening in your life, in your sphere, in your world, and how can you break those those scary like closets? Um, mm. And how brave are you willing to be for that? I don't know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, off the, t- off the top of my head, the only thing that happened to me personally and anecdotally that helps is like, for instance, my uh, I grew up in a Christian home too, so like my uncle uh, feeds homeless and like pastors and Little Rock. And so like being in a space where it was, I knew that I was comfortable and loved by everyone there. Like, you know what I'm saying? The community loved me and I was there to love the community or whatever. That felt like it was like, and so mm. I don't know if that's like a practical answer, but I, that's the only thing that I have off the top of my head that like helped me personally is like, mm-hmm. and it goes to kind of a Christian thing. I don't know what yeah. else to. Yeah. Mm. And I, I I, I just want to say that 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 fr- the phrase I think Jesus said it 
<laughs> love others yeah. as you love yourself or like treat people how you want to be treated, I think is so effective because if you realize like, okay, I'm going to go into this space, but let me apply this, this little teaching to this, this, you know, unfamiliar territory. Like, let mm. me treat them how I, I hope they can treat me in return. I think it's just a good way to just step, just step into something. You don't right. know what's going to happen. You're willing to take the risk, but you're like, okay, I mm. do want to show this notion of mutual respect. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you and so much. Yeah. Yeah. And people are waiting for kindness. Even if people have a shield, they're waiting for that kindness. Absolutely. Most, most likely it will be received, but thank yeah. you for your perspective and thank you for yeah. joining us. This is awesome. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much for talking and thank you all for y'all's perspectives. I appreciate what y'all are doing. So. Thank Yay. you so much. Bye. All right, so now we have, is this Mustafa? I hope I got that right. I think it is, yeah. Hello. Uh, hi, nice to see to meet you all. <laughs> nice to meet you too. So where are you calling from or zooming in from? Um, well, right now I'm in um, Pennsylvania, but I'm uh, currently in my basement at the moment. Okay. Do you have a comment or a question? Um, yeah. So I actually uh, heard the one on the, um, the corner over there. Uh, I actually saw her video yesterday and because I've just been searching online, like, what is critical race theory? Because, like, my initial thought is to reject it because, like, I, I've seen, like, I've heard a lot of right-wingers. Um, I'm not a right-winger, but I've heard a lot of right-wingers. Like, they're not fans of critical race theory. So my question is, what is critical mm -hmm. race theory? You know what? <laughs> that question is what a lot of people want to know and what for me. Okay. So I had an anti and pro critical race theory debate and I got more familiar with what it is, yeah. but um, the more, huh? Yeah. I saw uh, that debate and uh -huh. for some reason I still couldn't understand like what it was. It's because I think it's, there's no whole, for me, I don't think there's a holistic like view of what it is. I think everyone has interpreted it differently and people are using different literature different writers di different people heading it like people are like no kindy and rob and d'angelo are not part of crt while while i see a sloth of other people like no they are the leaders i'm like then what's going on um i think a lot of people's apprehension with crt is because they don't know what it is and i don't have the answer of what it is but i am searching to find the the origin of it the genesis of it um and Mm -hmm. I think it's been used as a boogeyman a little bit. It seems like, cause yeah. I've been trying to catch up to it too. And I watched uh, some of Kimmy's things, of course, watch yours, Brittany too. And, and, you know, get on Wikipedia and look at some things and, and um, you know, it's, it seems to be applied in a way that helps you make your point if you want to um, like, like the thing you had uh, uh, Brittany, when you had the different people from the different sides, they were almost talking about it. They were so in, in so much agreement to where you, I know you put that together to have to be able to understand both sides. And mm -hmm. they were really running right down the middle. Everybody was OK with part of it where it makes sense and reasonable. But mm -hmm. nobody was 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 for the unreasonable stuff. Which but I think good. when the right wing. Yeah, exactly. But I think yeah. when the right wingers talk about it, they make it seem like in school. And I don't know if this is the case. I don't have children in school anymore, but that that they're I don't know, you know, making kids cry because they're white and stuff and. I don't think anybody would think that's a good idea, but I don't think that's what it is either. You know, I, I think that's one of those things that's uh that's like, um, you know, I don't know, a, a fake news thing. Not, mm -hmm. not, to, oh, you Lord. know, yeah, oh, I know. Yeah. I, I want to just quickly speak to that because um, there's, there's actually a very good summary of it in one of the books on critical race theory. I'm not sure if it's a book by, uh, it was a book by Richard Delgado, or there's another one with the same name, and it's just a key writings compiled, but there was an introduction that expressed the idea of microaggressions and how, how race is more interwoven into our daily life and how we can be a, how we can like sort of dissect this in a legal sense so that we can enact justice for people who have been victims of, I'm actually reading this book right now called The Price We we pay 
by the same authors, Richard Delgado, and they're talking about how far is free speech? Like, how far can we take free speech? Mm -hmm. Like, if you paint a swastika on someone's, like, front door, can you sue that person? Like, or is it just kind of like, you know, they just, you know, do we classify it as vandalism if someone calls you the N-word and, like, repeatedly, like, how much is that, like, harassment? So I look, personally, I look at it as um, it, it's a school that emerges out of critical legal studies, which kind of takes a more nuanced analysis on what our skin color plays a role in, in these systems, how our gender plays a role in these systems, our sort of spectrum gender identity or like sexuality plays a role in that. But, but the pushback for me personally comes when I applied that concept of microaggressions to my everyday life mm. and got worse results in that analysis than I had bargained for. So initially I thought, you know what, I'm just going to be more conscious of like how everyone is sliding me in, the, in every way. And I want to be an advocate for that and, you know, you know, be mad about it and do something about it. Mm -hmm. But it actually harmed me in turn because as a black woman, and this is just my experience, by the way, I'm not a doctor. I don't have a PhD. I am just a person. But in my experience as a black woman, I had more of a setback than, say, other people who don't apply this microaggression analysis to their lives because I was more... I was spending more time worrying about what other people thought about me. So it, it actually backfired and I was less productive. So in a sense, say like if I was, a, I'm, I am a painter in a month, I would not say I would do like one, two paintings because I'm so scared all the time. I'm so anxious. I'm stressed out. I'm ill. I can't sleep because I'm carrying all of these things in my life. So mm -hmm. that's where I think the, the breakdown of, of the sort of well-meaning um, intentions of CRT kind of backfire against the black individual. And this is why I'm like, you know what? Black people, young, old, anyone who, who falls in any marginalized group, what if we actually empowered ourselves um, to, to not give that, 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 what Brittany was talking about earlier, like if someone is following you in the store, you kind of give them what you want by being angry about it and kind of letting that pull you down. Mm. That's the main pushback against critical race theory right now is that it actually disempowers where it it's comes in the veil of empowerment. And I think it is fair to just be one of those people who says, you know what, I found that this was actually worse for me than, than it was good for me. And it's just an opinion. And I think it's okay to have an opinion, especially if you're black, it is okay to think outside the box. So. Mm -hmm. so that's my that's my one frustration with critical race theory. Mm. Yeah, I, I can see that being a, a problem. I, I guess the thing that I think was interesting when I was looking into it, and like I said, I'm even less of a doctor and PhD than you, Kimmy, when it comes to this area. But <laughs> uh, but but um, but you know, when you look back in the history, I mean, those um, the the hurdles that were in place were real and they were mm -hmm. based on race, no, no. question about yeah. it. You know, when you when you mm -hmm. think of education and, you know, geez, voting rights, I mean, so many things, you know, it's, you know, I mean, I'm a huge fan of baseball and, and even in baseball, it was a huge thing. You know, it's, yeah. it's really, um, and it was literally based only on race and race only. That That's, yeah. that's all it was, mm -hmm. was, was right. just that. And so, you know, I think that has shaped things, you know, um, in certain ways, you know, I'm not saying that um, you should have all these microaggressions and all that stuff. That's a whole different thing that, yeah, I'm not sure I even can grasp uh, all that, mm. but, but, but I, you know, it's, yeah, it's, you know, one of the things I was, I was thinking of, and I, Brittany and I talked about this just recently, you know, the, the, the Tulsa thing, I can tell you I'm 61. Okay. Never heard about that in school when I was a kid, L mm -hmm. literally. And, and I think Brittany said she never heard about it in school. I never heard about it in school. You know, and she's 30 years younger than me or whatever it is, you know, and she never heard about it in school. I mean, so, you know, th these things like that, literally, they weren't taught in history. And teaching that in, in history now is not that bad a thing, you know, because oh. what we got was was obviously not what actually happened, you know. And mm -hmm. I don't think it's wrong to teach what actually happened to some degree. And I think that's one of the things people say. I don't want critical race theory. They're going to teach this stuff and it's slanted. It's like, no, that's what actually happened. I mean, what actually happened should be taught. I don't think there's any reason to ever not teach what actually happened. 
Um, well, you know, I think they should and, teach and the history. But, they could, but, yeah. but we haven't done that, though. That's that. That's the. Yeah. I, I'm just telling you that I don't know anybody my age. Yeah. Maybe smile on this and this thing over here will say it that they that they were taught that as a kid in school or even in college for that matter. I mean, I'm yeah. I'm not a history uh, background. I had my two, you know, my six hours of history that you you get to get a a BS in something. And we never, I don't remember anything like that, you know, that was, that yeah. was taught. So I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And some of the, some of the times when I hear like in our local paper and Brittany knows we're, you know, we live in the same town and our paper's kind of a big thing in our town in a way, mm-hmm. um, you know, they're, they're talking about our school system, you know, teaching some of these things and, and people are upset about some of these things being taught. And I'm thinking, I wouldn't be upset about understanding some of the things that actually happened and, and, you know, what? and. Not can just I skipping over. Can I, can sure. I start? Were because I, I didn't see that article. What were they upset on teaching history or teaching? I, I think it gets all muddled together, and it's not nuanced enough to be able to talk about just one thing. You know, because you can. It's kind of like the coronavirus with them spikes, right? The the spikes are the bad thing, but there's a lot of stuff in there that's probably not as bad. But it's all mm-hmm. looked at the same way. It seems like. And granted, I have not researched this at mm-hmm. a level, and and. I don't have any kids in it. And it's, it's the same thing with the LGBTQ stuff. It, it looks exactly the same. You know, I, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Jimmy. Go, no, go are ahead. You sure? Okay. Yep. Positive. Um, I just wanted to say, cr- at least from my understanding, critical race theory isn't the same as, as U.S. history at all. Um, I, I actually am an advocate of more history that teaches more of the racist acts. For example, like, can anyone name, you know, the first concentration camp or where it was established? Are you asking? I'm legitimately asking. Because, <laughs> see, for example, like, that was, that was uh, the first concentration camp actually happened in 1901 in German Southwest Africa and uh, in, in South Africa. And then a, a pre kind of trial round of a new sort of uh, concentration camp happened a little bit north in Zimbabwe in the early 1900s. And I think like if we teach like the history of why they did those things more than we teach, uh, more than we tell people like as a white person, you're, you're bad. I think people naturally can comprehend with more history that those things are bad than trying to kind of have this postmodernist like, like fickle, unable to pinpoint what's happening type of thing, which is the argument, I, my argument against critical race theory. Now, do people, people sense that something's wrong about critical race theory and critical social justice, but I don't think that they're advocating for not teaching what has happened in the past because there is like a media representation as well where they're saying uh, conservatives or right-wingers are upset that we're teaching slavery, which is actually not, I don't think that's the argument that I've been involved in. Um, I, I actually am very way more like Afrocentric. I'm like, please teach that Africa is not a country. It's a continent with 54 oh. countries. <laughs> and I, 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 that, I, I, that's, I, my, that's my stance. What, I, how do you feel about it, Mustafa? I'm curious to know your thoughts. I absolutely agree. They should teach that Africa. Like, first of all, when you ask most people about Africa, they can't even name, like, they can't even, they can only name one country in there, Nigeria. Like, right. That's Nigerian, <laughs> and, like, and, and I've been, uh, you, you should check out this channel, Home Team History. Like, he teaches like African history, uh, Black history. Like, and he would this one video he made was about African thought. So in college, uh, well, I hear they teach us in college. They teach Western thought. Like you know the Romans, the Greeks, the the birth of democracy, stuff like that. But can they teach African thought, like how like how Africans see the family? Because in Africa, so in this one culture, cousins um, they actually call each other brother and sister. Or or in my culture, um, we call. Like uh, somebody that's older than you, we call them grandma, or grandpa, even if they're mm-hmm. not necessarily related mm-hmm. to you. Mm-hmm. So, and there's many more. So I'm just hoping that they can teach that in college as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I fully 100% agree. Um, I just feel like 
people are unsure about whether critical race theory is that. And it's, it's like something so obscure, but it's like, it's from legal studies. Like it's from this other thing, but it absolutely has nothing to do with like the, you know, the teaching of history. And I think if we could be more uh, appreciative of like the origins of like African descendants of slaves or Africans. Africa, it's the birth, like it is the birthplace of civilization. We all came right. from Africa. Even, right. Even mm. uh, Lee over there came, like he. I totally agree. <laughs> you don't got to tell me. I, I, I know, the, I know that's, <laughs> that's the cradle of humanity. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So but, yeah, um, I'm down for that. But another question I have about CRT is that, so you learned CRT in uh, college? That's right. So did you have any like white uh, classmates that you learned it with? Oh, that is a great, you just brought back like a flashback that was like, it hit oh, me. Lord. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I did. And let me tell you, it actually was really hard because a lot of people were like, a lot of white students, I should be specific, a lot of white students were like, I don't know. And I read that as like, oh, they're struggling because like they're racist. And that aided my, mm. my embrace of critical thinking, uh, I mean, critical theory thinking, rather than kind of be like, oh, wh why do they not see it that way? Does that make sense? So like, there were some students who were like, I don't know if all men are like misogynistic, if we're talking about, you know, other schools of like gender studies and stuff. Or, you know, there was some pushback, but then I interpreted that as, oh, they're struggling with their internalized racism or like they, they kind of can't come to the truth. Uh, mm -hmm. And so it proved that theory correct in my eyes. I don't know, mm -hmm. Brittany, how, how, how was it for you in that, in, in that journey? In, in you ever, CRT? In like coming to, did you ever embrace CRT, by the way? No. Okay, we okay. never <laughs> were taught that at all. Oh, but I okay. but I just want to chime in about the history. I am beyond been advocating about since I was 18. Like yeah. when I got out of high school, and then what I learned on my own, I was like, why didn't I learn that Booker T. Washington established Tuskegee University? And that was the university my dad went to. Like, why did I learn like all of these different things? This would have empowered me as a black kid. I don't need CRT necessarily empowered me, just teach the history the way it was. And then people organically um, happen the way it needs to be happening. But yeah, I, I'm a proponent for that. But like Kimmy said, some CRT literature I have read does advocate for more history to be taught. But then there's others that that's not in there. And it's about teaching people about how they're racist or how they're disenfranchised all the time. Like, yeah, I don't want my kids learning that. And like, I, I'm just very, thinking, very like, very if I was a kid, how would that have affected me? Like, right. would it have been great on my end? Um, oh, but, but, that, but, but that was the case 70 years ago, though, in this country, what? literally, right? Yeah. I mean, you were, I mean, if you were African-American, you were disenfranchised. No, I'm know, not saying that's not slavery. true. I'm not saying no, that's I mean, not I mean, true. No, I mean, literally, I mean, that yeah. is literally what the case was. So I, I don't know if they're... You know, and maybe they are doing this. No, Brittany, Lee, maybe I'm you're right. I'm talking about telling, telling kids right now. now, telling kids now that yeah, yeah. that the the that the world is already set against you mm -hmm. at a young age. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, and, and that's not good. I totally agree. But I'm not totally saying good. that CRT like holistically, because I have like the people in the panel. Their takes are totally different. And I'm like, what you're saying, it makes sense to me. And then there's other people who I'm like, are is this CRT or are you just attaching CRT to this? Right. And, you know what I mean? Yeah. In the same I, sense of BLM, you know, people do that. But yeah, uh, we have so many people in the chat. It's oh. capacity. Oh. Um, it yeah. So do you have last um a last comment, Mustafa? And then we're gonna uh, move on because we have like I'm gonna have we have five minutes. Oh yeah, yeah. So my last comment is um well it, it's interesting hearing about um all of your experiences. And the reason I asked uh, if you had a like white people that you learn critical race theory with white classmates is because I'm wondering if 
So my thought, and I may be wrong on this, is that even if critical race theory is thought, so I read it and it just didn't make any sense to me. So my, I just thought that like the kids who are learning it together, they really like, they don't actually care about it enough to mm. like take it with them. Cause you know how school is like, you learn something one week and then you forget it the next. I mean, that's how. So you're saying it's is. not being applied. It's just another yeah. thing they're reading. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, I hope I, I may be wrong, but mm. I hope that's the case. So I hope that like a white classmate and a black classmate, you know, a classmates of different races who learn critical race theory that they don't, you know, carry it on with them and their friends. So that's why I asked if she had a white classmate that she learned it with, were you guys still friends after you learned this um, theory? Oh, uh, I honestly, I would say there are some people that I have, I had cut off not because we learned together and then like it was like more so like because their racism was too much in terms of microaggressions like i was receiving too much of like oh you're doing too many things that you don't even know about so i cut them off um in hindsight now i actually have reached out to a lot of them some of them were my former pastors so not necessarily co college students but just people that i did life with and i'm like hey i had a very narrow lens with which I was like having you know uh, with which I established our friendship or our relationship and I'm so sorry and I hope you can forgive me for like cutting you off because you don't even know why I did that but I was just like trying to protect myself from all this racism that I was experiencing um and so I would say now I've kind of amended a, as much as I could remember um and I think we're now friends so I definitely did put them off for a bit and then I I was like, okay, let's let's try this again. If that well, answers your question. Well, uh, thank you for answering my question. Thank you for having me on. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. It was great talking to you. You're good talking thank to you. Yourself, huh? Thanks. Hi, Laura M. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing so well. Um, thank you for patiently waiting. Of course. Yeah, I actually came in at the end of your full conversation. So uh, I'm looking forward to going back and, and, and watching. But uh, I, I don't know exactly what I want to say necessarily. But I just know that uh, I want to share my appreciation for you both. Uh, and Lee, nice to meet you. It's the first time I'm seeing you on any of Brittany's videos. So I look forward to seeing more of your conversations. Um, but I've, you know, really come from uh, drinking the Kool-Aid uh, so to speak, uh, about six years ago. I'm in the Bay Area. Um, I was definitely one of those people who were immense advocates of CRT. I was like super on that side of it. I was like doing these meetings and talking to other white people about this, what we have to do and that it's our struggle and X, Y, Z. And you know, over the course of hearing, you know, different perspectives, like yours in particular, Brittany, uh, as well as reading some other uh, heterodox thinkers, like really understanding how infantilizing and how um, it just, all of the different tenets and ideas really just talk about disempowerment. So I just want to say mm -hmm. thank you both so much. And, you know, it gives me strength to talk about it in a way that, you know, is heterodox as well, because as you both know, uh, it is more challenging for us to go ahead and do that just because of, especially in the Bay Area, it's like the epicenter of oh, <laughs> yeah. that. Um, so I also wanted to, Kimmy, share your sense of optimism, both of your senses of optimism, of course, but Kimmy, you in particular, about, yeah, about, um, this idea of you know free black thought and the tipping point i really feel that i'm seeing it as well um even in my you know small circles of folks that i follow uh and as well as kind of the logical fallacies uh that are being pointed out as well as you know these arguments and things we know that they can't hold up eventually truth for me and my truth is that truth always comes to light so the fact that um these arguments will eventually uh, be called out and shot down. I feel that truthfully. So anyway, I just wanted to express my appreciation and um, please, you know, keep doing what you're doing. And I really, really am enjoying the, the conversations that I hear you have, Brittany, 
Thank you. I commend you both very much. Thank you so much, Laura. Thank you so Laura, much. I appreciate you're it. Awesome. You're awesome. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you. Thank you. Bye. Absolutely. Bye. Bye bye. Oh, we have one. Okay. Uh, I don't know how long you guys. Hello. How are you? Sorry. I'm good. How are you? Your name's covered. I see Jane. Oh, uh, Ira. Ira Jane. Ira. Jane. Yeah. Hi. Hello. Hello. Do you have a question, comment? Uh, I guess a bit of both, but I'll make it quick because I know uh, you're running a bit of a tight schedule here. Um, yeah, thanks, thanks, you, thank you guys for um, uh, speaking up on everything here. I'm a little nervous right now, so if I don't make sense, I apologize in advance. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, I'm actually I'm from Canada, um, so I don't know how relevant um, my views would be on here. Here, but um, um, but a lot of the CRT stuff is very. Um, it's really getting more, um, I guess, exposure here in Canada. So um, I guess what I want to say is, because I'm, I'm also a, I, I guess I want to say I'm, a, I'm also a conservative Christian. So um, I guess my comments would be just how, like, um, just trying, like, how, how to tackle, like, the viewpoints of CRT from a Christian perspective. But I know you guys kind of talked about that earlier. Um, uh, in the conversation. So I really appreciate those views. Those are really, really helpful. But, um, but at the same time, just, uh, seeing how like CRT is being, um, used here in Canada. Cause like, um, like I don't even know how in Canada, like the, um, the black people here in Canada, like, I don't know how systemic racism really affects them. Cause I don't, I don't really know how, like my history is terrible. So like, I don't know how the history here would, um, the, like the, the historical systemic racism had affected people here compared to the indigenous people. For sure, like there's definitely like deep, like deep roots of, of that here. Like, um, I don't know if you guys heard about that, that whole thing in BC, like they found the 215 remains of um, kids in the, uh, the residential school in BC. So that was really heartbreaking to hear. So it's like little, it's like stuff like that. That's really like that. Um, yeah. Mm. So, yeah. Mm. So, yeah, it, it's heartbreaking. It's really yeah. heartbreaking. So, um, so like just trying to figure out ways on how to, um, how to, uh, you know, speak to people about those things and like, um, and, and like how I don't know how, like I'm not really making sense here. Like, no, yeah. I'm a little nervous, so you're good. But, you're good. You're fine. <laughs> but um, but yeah, just thought I would yeah kind of make a comment on that. But like also a question on how like how do how I would tackle like those kind of issues um with CRT and like stuff like that. So yeah, <laughs> I think Kimmy's a pro with that. I yeah. would I would love to to speak to that. Um. So I, I kind of mentally in my life, I operate in like timelines. Um, right. For me, I, I find a lot of this discussion of race. I go back to like six, I believe it was 1650 when we kind of had this division of racial classes and the sort of emphasis on like the superiority of the Caucasian race and et cetera, et cetera. And then in 1833, we have William Wilberforce, who was kind of like, you know what? Like, slave is our brother. Like, there's something not right about this. Um, and then my big issue is that critical race theory is very new relative to all the things that have happened um, in 1865 and in the 1960s civil rights movement, 1948, apartheid was established. And in the 1960s, people fought back against that. And then we, we see the emergence of CRT, like, after that, like in the 70s leading up to the 90s, it's a relatively new school of thought. Is it the, it, is it the one school of thought that made us realize that racism is wrong? If we look at the timeline, I would argue no. It's not the first thing that awoke you know, so many people to like, oh, the slave is our brother. That started in the 1800s, right? So I believe that we don't need it because of the sort of radical, I like, the radicalization that comes with it. And I use this example of Mein Kampf where you can, you can say like, oh, you, haven't, you can't really criticize the Holocaust because you haven't read Mein Kampf and you don't understand it. 
It's like, no, I can criticize what came when people embraced the ideas of Hitler's struggle. And I don't think that outcome is good at all. And so I don't even need to read the book to tell you that the Holocaust was wrong, right? So when people are like, we need CRT to, to say that what's, what happened in Canada is wrong, I'm like, I think someone who doesn't even know what CRT is can tell you that that's wrong. Like, mm -hmm. we don't need this legal school of thought to be the one to tell us how it's wrong. Christians have always operated out of like that, that what Will Rouge calls the operating system of morality. So we're very conscientious about, oh, that was wrong. That was murder. You know, like that was wrong. You were treating someone with partiality. Um, so in this case where they're trying to say like, okay, we need CRT in order to really uh, emphasize the plight of like the indigenous peoples, I'd argue that your Christian faith alone, Ira, is sufficient enough to say, I, I care about them because they're my human brother. And I care about them because I, I'm a human as well and I sympathize. Um, so I think people want, want to mix CRT with like human sympathy. And I'm like, I don't, the timeline suggests otherwise. So that's mm. my answer. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Definitely. I hope, I hope that's helpful for you. Yeah, definitely. Because um, it's just one of those things where it, it's a really sensitive topic. And uh, especially like with indigenous peoples here, because it's, it's very like, um, deeply rooted in history and here in Canada. So yeah, mm -hmm. it's definitely helpful. I really appreciate your guys's views and everything. And yeah, I think that's everything I have really questions. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> thank well, you, thank you for tuning in from Canada. I appreciate yeah, it. Thank you so much. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Thank, Bye. Thank you. Bye. Okay, we have how many more people? We have four. Oh, Lord. I'm going to have to bring in like multiple people at once. Yeah, let's go for it. Let's bring in multiple people. Let's I'll just, just have a party. We're hey, I party. think your whole six thing is, is, is I, not. I know. An issue for you. Why? <laughs> okay, I can only do five at once. Oh. Hi, everyone. Um, I think you're muted. You're muted. Yeah, too. I took it off. Yeah. Are you muted? Can you hear me? I can hear yeah, you, Misty. I, okay. I can't hear the gentleman. I think he might be frozen. Well, we'll Maybe see. Um, go ahead. Um, do you have a comment or question, Missy? Yes, I do. I have a I'm I think I bring to this discussion a very different perspective. Um, okay. as a as a person, I'm very solution oriented. Mm. So I think my one observation before my question is that there's a lot of talk going on. And in a lot of in life, a lot of things are complex, and there's a propensity, I think, to have a lot of discussion. Mm -hmm. And discussion is good, but I think directed discussion to an end is what matters. And I think right now the race conversation in our dis in our countries or in the Western world, it's 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 a it's a discussion that goes nowhere. It's mm -hmm. just a lot of a lot of talk about history. This happened. This happened to who? This person did that. And it, and, and and history is important. Don't get me wrong. But I think like most relationships, let's say, you know, you have a couple that's going through a hard time. You go to counseling and if you just go back and forth constantly, you did this to me, I, you did that to me, you said that, that hurt my feelings. I mean, some of that has to come out, but at some point you have to focus on improving the relationship. And I think, it, I think what will make the most difference is if we focus on a solution. Um, and I and I think Kimmy's last point was really poignant is that we did we don't need critical race theory um, and a lot of the contemporary jargon to come to some of the most basic conclusions. Mm. Racism racism is wrong because like Kimmy said, love your neighbor as you love yourself. And some of the most basic tenets, treating people with respect, you know, don't touch things that don't belong to you. Just some of the, you know, like that old book, everything I needed to know about life I learned in kindergarten. I think a lot of the race discussion can be solved if we just, history is good, but history is not going to solve our problems. Our problem is problems with human nature, mm -hmm. how we treat each other, how we mm -hmm. see each other. And I think by focusing on what's wrong, it's, it's a place, you can go there, but I think we would be better served if we focus on where we want to go. 
What mm. do we want to solve? And when this is over, what do we want our world to look like? Because I think rehearsing history and, and wrongs and rights is not going to get us where we want to go. Mm-hmm. Missy. That's a great point. Yes, that's good. I'm all about the solutions. Um, I do think that conversations like this, with you coming on and having a different perspective, is to me a solution like dialogue and conversations. Now, I understand the same old talk on race. I I, I am into having different discussions about it um, because we've seen time and time again, it's like we're stalling. It's like we're not, the needle isn't moving further, but I agree with you. Um, I'm for the solutions and I feel in a sense, this is my way of contributing that. Um, All right, Supo, what, what is our goal? I mean, has anyone said, okay, mm-hmm. when this when this discussion, however however long we have it, mm-hmm. what do we want to have happen at the end? And I think that is the part, I think once we get to that point, I think that's when the progress is made. And mm-hmm. it's, it's like they were talking about um, when one who shall not be named, you know, when they were in office and they did a lot of traveling, you know, you can't mistake mm-hmm. progress, you can't mistake activity for progress. Mm. And mm. we can talk That's about funny. racism for a long, long time. Mm. But what are we shooting for? And that's my question to you all. Where does the where does our society with regard to the racism, where does it need to go and what do we need to do to get there? I think that's the million dollar question, to be honest. Yeah. And and I don't have that answer, but I strive every day to get there. Um you guys can chime in if you want, but yeah. Um, Lee, do you want to throw something in there? I mean, yeah, I don't, I don't know where, how to get there. I, I wouldn't be, be crazy to. Even I mean, if say I that. knew where, then I, I, I had the map out for everyone. But let's go. Yeah, but. exactly. But I, I do, I do think. I mean, I honestly do think things are are getting better, and I think they will continue to do so. I'm, I'm an optimist that way too. Like, like, like you said, Kimmy. I mean. Just look at interracial marriage and how much that has changed in my lifetime. That has changed a lot. It was illegal in 1969. You know, I was 10 then. I didn't even know what that was then, you know, but I mean, you, you just look around, you know, I mean, I mean, there, a lot of people are probably not happy seeing how the races are mixing, but they are mixing and they're mixing all over the world, not just here in the U S mm-hmm. I mean, I, so I do think, I think with that happening, I don't think it's possible for it not to get better be- because, yeah. because you're, you're just going to be, you're, you're finally going to be uh, able to um, interact at a different a level that you never could before, <laughs> you know, and I yeah. think that's going to make it better just by, just by doing that. Now, I don't know if it, I'm not saying it's going to take 30 years or 50 years, a hundred years, but, but I do think it, it can, it, it can get better. You know, I, I really do think it can get better. Um, you know, I, 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 I won't I won't put a time frame on there. And of course, where I'm sitting, you know, as 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 a white guy, you know, I know it. It for me, it's I'm not on the bad end of that stick. And neither have my ancestors been, you know, as much. Mm-hmm. So I'm not fighting for um, that for myself, like others are fighting for themselves. And I can totally understand why that is the case. I guess that's that that's where I come from. And that is I. I, I read a, re- a book yeah. recently that was called White Rage, and it was really interesting. Just this, I, I wasn't aware of all the things and the particulars of, you know, I, I didn't realize that in the South, when the whole Jim Crow started, that they put up those statues, those guys, just to piss the black people off. Cool. Then you think about that. I mean, you think about that's the motivation for doing it. You right. know, we, we see it here today, and all we hear about is statues being torn down in history, this, but that was literally put up to piss people off. Mm. I mean, think right, about but that. that was, but that was the past. And yes, sometimes no, but, they but say I, mean, the motivation some... is, I never knew the motivation. Right. I mean, the motivation was deviant. Right. And, and then you've got people today acting like that was some, you know, great grand thing. And it's like, but it, but it really wasn't. That's not what that was. You know, right, and, but and then, I but think that's a really interesting thing. I never knew that. I never knew mm-hmm. that, um, that that those that those were there j- literally just to keep people down, you know. They, they are there that in your face, you know, basically is what it is. And and I, I don't know how I would feel about that if I was on the other side of that. You know, I'm not on the other side of that, right? So I don't I don't have an innate feel feeling. But I'd like to think 
I could be naturally and objectively, and, and I would be allowed to be pissed off a little bit about that, depending on how I was brought up, you know? So that's how I look at that. I'm not saying this is a CRT thing. I'm just saying that, that the, the sins of the past, one, one thing I did want to say, and I want to throw this in here, and this is really to what Brittany was saying, what Brittany went through early on in this thing about her, you know, her um, story, you know, to her faith, okay? That's something the U.S. has not done yet. They're not capable. I don't think as a country, we're not capable as a country to look at our sins of the past, call them for what they are, and move forward. Because we, half of our country does not do that. Half of our country oh. thinks nothing wrong. Half of our country thinks, half of our country thinks, half of our country thinks that it is Christian values that solve, that, that, that Christian values would put us, put us in slavery. That didn't take us out of slavery. Uh, that's not a Christian value. No, that's it was slavery. recognizing. It's not, no, no, it listen, wasn't a Christian value. I'm that, sorry. That did not tear that down. The, you know, modern thought tore, tore that down. That wasn't just Christianity that did that. And and we have these, what, what do you, and you look at the indigenous people, uh, the lady from Canada brought up. I mean, that it literally, that, it that wasn't is, Christian that values rooted. that create slavery. It was, no, it is, it was it weaponizing the Bible. Of the time. Of yeah. the yeah. time. Yeah. And that, and that is that is a sin of that. And we, yeah, and we white are supremacy not, is a big we, sin, right? That's a huge sin. That's a that's a huge that's a I, huge thing, exactly. But I mean, I, I don't think we're, I don't think the U.S. collectively looks at that. And when we try to shine a little light on it, or, and I'm not saying we, me, right? But I'm mm -hmm. saying that's what gets pushed back on. Like, we, you know, we are not, we don't have an exceptional past, and there's nothing wrong with saying that. Brittany doesn't have an exceptional past either. Brittany, please, I hope you don't take that the wrong way. No, I don't. <laughs> but you have the courage. But you have the courage to 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 say, you know, at this point, you know, I things weren't right. But at this point, I've got them, you know, better. And I'm not. I'm not trying to stamp on Christianity here. Don't get me wrong. I, I'm, I'm not meaning to do that. But what I'm saying is, we. I don't think from where I sit, I I, I see no. I mean, there's there's we have some huge issues that we should. I'm not saying we should be proud of them, but we shouldn't be ashamed of admitting what they are. And I think a lot of people are ashamed to are, are ashamed to say what they are. And that, for me, that irritates me because I think it's a lie. I you think know? that's a. I and think that's even, a. I don't even have a, a dog in the fight, and it bothers me. That's I how much that's it bothers a, me. I think that's a misconception on your part. I think um, the fact that you, you don't can think those things half, are wrong. I think I think that you the fact that you think half the country doesn't care. I think that's that's a huge. Um, well, I'm generalizing. I'm, a, Obviously, right. I'm generalizing there. Right, but it's 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 still a bias. It's still a generalization about half the country, and I think again, it goes back to the whole idea. It's like I, I was really struck by your statement that as a white man, you're trying to identify with my pain. I would, and and I think that's a good thing. Empathy is great, but how about being as invested in my victory going forward. And I think right now, everybody wants to dwell on the pain of the past. Yeah, we blew it. This country made mistakes, but there's not a country on this planet that didn't. And even the right. mistakes that we made, we have acknowledged. I mean, I'm old enough to remember Bill Clinton actually apologizing for racism when he was president of this country, and that's and that's my concern is that there's we we're we're dwelling on the sins of the past, the sins of the past. It's it's like the old saying you can't you you, you can't you can't change the past. We, we we made mistakes. It was wrong. We all know it. Most of us are not in denial about it. I think was my concern is what can we do? What can we say to get past it? And it's mm -hmm. like we're spending so much time on it that we can't get past it. Well, what I are our what are our what are our states doing today for for election with related to the election rules and stuff like that? And I'm not all freaked out about some of the stuff, but mm -hmm. do we think what's happening right now? What just happened after 2020, right? The 2020 election, where there are states literally doing things that probably affect one group of people more than another group of people. Well, we're I mean, we are literally, well to we're, clarify what those things are. What are the things that they put in, they're putting in place that make it hard? Be specific. Well, I think, I, I, think, think, I, th I think they're making, I think, I think the, uh, you know, we didn't always have ID requirements. And I'm not saying no ID, but I mean, when you, when you impose something that is, that is harder on one group of people than the other. Why when, is when it you, hard? 
Whoa, it's hard that's, 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 that's hard racism. Her. That is I just racism. want to say, wait, wait, how, is that, how that. in the world wait, is it hard? What, what? what makes it hard? Wait, hold that's on. Racist. If I don't have a driver's okay. license, I might not have we don't, one. We don't need to throw that around. What did you say, Jimmy? Right. Sorry. I just wanted to say, it's kind of ironic because I think you made a video on on the uh, the the ID um, in response to the sort of ID discrepancy. Oh, yeah. Or the idea so that, like, you know, uh, a lot of like white liberals have the assumption that black people don't have IDs. And then this interviewer mm -hmm. went to a black neighborhood mm -hmm. and, you know, almost all the people he interviewed had IDs. Well, it's, it's not think... just black people. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not using college IDs for young people to vote. Where we're in Texas, I think you can use your hunting certificate to vote, your hunting license, which doesn't have a picture on it. I mean, it's so I'm not talking about just race here. I'm talking about I'm talking about we are, you know, it, it's just like, when was it 1913 or I'm, I'm sorry, 2013, 2012, the Shelby overturned by the Supreme Court. What happened after that? I mean, all the states that had to have congressional approval before they could change their voting laws all started doing that. You know, they well, literally that was started already doing in that. place. That was already in the place because the Constitution said that states are the ones who have to administer elections. So that's that's actually just returning to what's already been established. But the whole idea is you have yeah, elections but the, but the every two. You have but, but elections the every two years. states were not doing it equally, though. That's the thing, right? That's what the that's what the Voting Rights Act's about, right? Okay, the states so weren't doing that right. <laughs> I mean, they, I, you're I, right. That's what the Constitution says. But states were literally saying. I'm not going to let black people vote in my state. That's the whole Selma thing, right? I mean, that's no. That's so an assumption. you had to come in. That's an assumption, but more importantly, if just from a very practical point of view, we have elections every two and every four years. You have two years to get your ID together, right? I'm, I'm, I'm I, not, I am. I am confident. The ID part. I am. I'm very confident that students, people of color, black people, indigenous people, have two years, and that two years they can get themselves together enough to be ready to vote. I'm, I'm confident of that. What about, what about, how about this then? Let me, let me throw this out there. How about, and again, I don't have this because I live in Columbus with Brittany, where it is so easy to vote. There are no long lines ever mm -hmm. compared to inner cities where they don't have enough um, or their truck boxes are moved and things do happen. I mean, those things are, they're, they're not insignificant in my opinion. Moving, but there are... forget, forget the IDs. Let's, let's say mm -hmm. if you, if if you can't if if you can't drop your absentee ballot off and you and you reduce the number of those, and and in and big cities where you have you know where you rely on buses and I'm not that's not black people right I'm talking about anybody who lives in that situation I drive I park in a parking lot it's easy all that stuff is easy I don't got to pay to park I don't have to get it there's no schedule you know but if you have to do that stuff and you change those kinds of things I mean they are going to indirectly affect a voting population. And, Except and that's, that's not real. Just... Except that's not real. If you go to the average inner city, which where I live, most of your voting, most of the voting polling places are literally within walking distance of your house for most people. That's not real. That I, I, I think it might depend on your state. I can I just interject for a second? Sure. I just wanted to speak speak to Missy's original question. Your name is Missy, right? Unfortunately, mm -hmm. I can't see it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um what what are the solutions that we're looking at? For like, what goal do we have in mind? Because we can make mm -hmm. all, we can talk all day, we can do this live stream for four hours, but still not end up with any practical steps, right? I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that's what you, your, your, your initial question was. Not only practical steps, but before we put any practical steps, let's figure out what our goal is first. What are we right. shooting for? When you pick up your bow and arrow, what's the target? Right. Oh, that's mm -hmm. good. Oh. Bow and arrow. What's the target? Yeah. Oh, you want to say something, good. Brittany? No, no, I was just amening that okay. statement. Yeah, that's great. I, well, I think I, I think the go for a voter thing is every American, sh it should be easy to vote and equally easy to vote no matter where you live. And I want to speak think to that, Lee. Really, I think sociologically, we're always going to kind of be able to deduce a pattern based on, on similar traits that a group might have. Um, but that might not speak to to how equal something is or or even the equality of outcome those might always vary i think this is something jordan peterson talks about that even if you level it 100% we're always going to still kind of have this pull apart um, and you'll you'll see these trends as people do whatever they have to do like we aren't going to be able to box in humanity but i do want to speak to the question of finding a solution solution for racism and 
And I want to go back to Brittany's very first talking point at the beginning of this live stream, which is that one side is so like they don't want to address the issue of racism at all. It's like, I don't even want to talk about it. Like it gives me a headache. Like I'm tired of talking about it. I don't want to learn about it. And then there's this other side that wants to end racism. And it's like their goal is they want to end it. I personally, for me, I stand in the position where I, I don't believe that we're going to solve evil. I mean, if we're going to solve racism, mm -hmm. then there are going to be other factors that we also would want to end. We would want to end uh, misogyny and then we would want to end murder and then we would want to end. And I don't think we're ever going to eradicate evil as it exists. And that's an idea that just comes from my Christian faith. So what do I, what do I look at archivally that informs my, my, my approach to race? I look at the life of Nelson Mandela and what did he do? He did his best to appreciate Africana um, culture, which is like the white Dutch settlers in Africa, to appreciate it despite everything that they, all the evil that they had done, right? To say, okay, I'm not gonna eradicate your language you get to stay in South Africa and you can keep your language and we'll make it an official language of South Africa. Um, he went to, there's this, this great movie Invictus where he went to an Africana like rugby match. Uh, I believe it was a world cup uh, of rugby. And it was just a symbol of, look, I appreciate your culture and I'm not here to send you away. Like, you know, what happened in the North in Zimbabwe or where they like chased out the white farmers. He was like, I believe we can coexist. I don't expect you to completely throw away all your whiteness. And that would be like, you know, the whiteness of South Africa was being an Africana. He just was like, hey, can we live together? Can I respect your culture as you respect my culture? Can we have 11 official languages instead of just like one or two, um, which is South Africa has 11 official languages. Like they elevated everybody. And I think in this American climate, how can we appreciate um, I hate to use the word, but this is like, you know, something that I had a fear of was like rednecks in the South. I know that might not be a great term, but like, how can we appreciate that without just fearing it and being like, oh, they're going to, they're going to treat me in a specific way. How can we say, I'm not here to destroy your culture. I'm not here to destroy your traditions, but I want you, I want to appreciate what you have and what you bring to the table as I hope that you can appreciate what I have and what I bring to the table. Um, and so you'll, you'll have, a, you will always have a mixed bag. Not everyone's going to be like, hey, I surrender my whiteness or like I surrender my Confederate flag or whatever. I don't expect everyone to change, but I know that we can have a big middle ground of people who are just ready to respect one another and lay their weapons down. That's what I saw in South Africa. That's what I lived in for seven years where people were just like, oh, you're an Africana. Like, hey, who got it? You know, like speaking the language, even if you're black and hearing uh, white Africanas also speaking Spedi or Kosao, like Zulu, like just a mutual respect of culture. I think that's so necessary because we have this stigma of what the other side is like. It's like, oh, white supremacists, like, oh, lefties that are crazy Antifa. So that's that's my personal mm -hmm. goal. Mm -hmm. Well, like that middle too. ground. <laughs> the middle ground, I mean, that's cliche as it sounds, but that is the start of it. Because we, yeah. everyone has their own solution. It's not that we don't have a solution out there. It's just too many, and people want it their way, yeah. and there's no compromise. Right. Uh, I think compromise. the first compromise of the, the key word of the day. Ooh. But thank you, Missy, so much for coming on and giving you. your yep, point of view. You. Hope to see you on another live stream. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Bye. 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 Okay, so I have to catch a flight um, <laughs> to New York. Not what? right now. Oh. But I'm going to tomorrow. Um, I'm going to ask the next two people. I don't know if you're still here, but please, uh, 30 seconds, your comment, your question. I don't know if this person's here anymore. Hello? I'm here. Oh, Hello? you are? Hi. Yes. Yes. All right. Thank, thank you for having me on. I just mm -hmm. want to say that um, there is a path to get there, to get to this place. And that path has already been um, shown by Howard Thurman. Have you guys ever heard of Howard Thurman? He, you should look him up. He is one of the people that basically brought or made what we now know as Christian mysticism to America. Now with his teachings, he was able 
to, and this doesn't mean that we, everyone has to turn into be Christian or anything, but what he did with his church is that he focused on things, or, or his main focus was, was based on quieting the mind. The only way racism, all these other things, uh, and all this stuff is based on having a noisy mind. So he did things that was fo that fo that focused more on people on quiet in their mind, and then at the same time too, not identifying with the body, not identifying with the race, with their race or whatever, and with and these practices that he ended up doing. He was the first person in the 30s to come out in America, mind you, in the 30s to come out with the first interracial and also interfaith church. The the um, civil rights movement was created in his vision. Martin Luther King created the the that organ that um the civil rights or um um organization or sorry the the whole civil rights based in his image. <laughs> and even in that, he did not fully join the movement. That's the word I was looking for. The movement. He did not fully join the movement because he wanted to take it further. He wanted what's called self transcendence. He wanted people to go beyond the race. And a lot of the people in the movement did not understand him. And they were like, oh, you're into that mystical stuff or whatever. But no one really went on with his teachings. So I feel that is the truest thing. Because when, I, um, when I'm in groups of people that are, that are like, I, that are, that are connected to mystic teachings, in other words, when I'm in, like to go to yoga classes and when I um, do other things where people that, you know, really um, are connected to these type of teachings. The thing is, is that none of us really look at each other as races. We look deeper and we feel a togetherness with us, with each other. And I feel those are basically the things that we really need to start trying to put in society. And also too, just the focus on virtues live in a virtuous way no matter what race you are you can live on virtue and a high focus on virtue is what's going to take us there mm -hmm. i think if we go with the notion of what kimmy says and what she talks about in her videos like respect love forgiveness exactly you know? Those are all virtues like a high value on virtues the problem is is that we're um and this is a, and this whole critical race thing i feel is kind of like a new form of racism now a lot of people don't weren't understanding um what what it's based in the problem is, is that critical race theory did not start out as what they're teaching it was it, it was started out as more as um a way it, it was it started out as a way to get rid of race you know they want everyone to think each other they want everyone to realize that we're actually one human race but it's been bastardized and what happened is that a lot of communists have taken the 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 whole name of taking the name and they put their own thing and instead they're teaching communism but instead of like um going by class they're going by race now hmm. and that is the basis of what the and that's where the anti-racism they fall into the same thing it's based on communism they're trying to and even if you look at a lot of these people that are really into these teachings of or put in forth criminal race theory, you'll notice that a lot of them are communists. A lot of them are into the communism um, type of ideology. And this is a new way for them to bring in con or, or to try to like bring in communism because people already know that communism has a bad name. So they want to change the name and the actions behind it. Or I'll not, I shouldn't say the actions, they just want to change the name. I just want to say one thing. You guys should go look up a guy named Manning Johnson. He came out with a book called Color, Communism, and Common Sense. You can read the book free on a website called manningjohnson.org. He came out with this book in the 30s. He was a black man that joined the communist movement. And he literally predicted most of the things that you're seeing right now. He left the movement because he realized that it was false. And the things going on right now, he predicted this in the 30s. And he showcased how this movement was the true race, is a truly a racist movement. So this mm. is what's going on right now. And it's been predicted. And we got to like literally... Um, 
stand up to this this type of teaching. Now, stand up with love. Exactly, stand up with love, saying that, and, and that's the thing. Like we got other white people, we got other races coming together to go against this. So it's not like it has to be like you know that we're separate as a race to stand up as this. We're coming together together as as different races to stand up against these teachings. Mm-hmm. Now I just want to say real quickly, Lee, I respect your passion and everything. I hear what you were saying a while ago with like um, the voting and stuff like that. See, the problem is, is that you are one of the people that's kind of like hurting us as a community, as black people. No, he's not. Wait, listen, listen, I don't mean this in a mean way. I just mean like this. I mean, I mean, I mean, like when you think in this way, like, like that, that we can't get. um, No, I have to interject because I've known. I'm not saying you can't. I'm I'm just talking about how how it was and how how the history is. Yes. Has been just so bastardized. It's got nothing to do with what's happening today and how you should feel i'm not talking about that okay all right well if i'm judging you in the wrong way i i i um, that's okay you can i mean it's i mean i'm i am sure i'm yeah i i am yeah i am yeah i I do have thick skin as far as that goes yeah i i yeah i hope i didn't offend you any because that's not my intention at all okay Um, Okay, I guess, you know, this is the thing, and this is how we change as people, you know, like, you know, we just came and look at this, we've already came to a resolution. You realize, you realize yeah. I realize you weren't saying uh, you didn't mean the thing that you meant, and you meant, and you realize that you said it in a way that, you know, just was what we meant. This is how we come to resolutions, guys. Yep. So, you know, plain and simple, you know, this is the way, and like, let's, let's just move forward. But again, we really got to focus on the present, that's where our power truly is. And the present mm-hmm. comes and to, 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 fully, fo- to fully be in the present is to basically fully be aware of what we are right, of what we're doing and what we're thinking as in the moment. Mm-hmm. And that's the key thing. If the more we could do that, the more we can move forward as not only people, but as humanity. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Bye. Bye. Okay, we have the, our last person, Kai Davis. Let's bring you on. Hi. Hello, how are you? I'm how doing you well. How are you? Doing Great. all right. Do you Great. have a question or comments? Uh, yes, I have a question. I'm from Tulsa, Oklahoma, and so going. We grew up in uh, mm-hmm. you know, on the east side, and like I went to a uh, sort of black preparatory school, and so I was one of the few people who like grew up hearing about you know Greenwood and stuff like that, and so we would go out to greenwood for like school trips and just like walk around the church and like as a kid i didn't realize the gravity of the situation until i got much older but um i just wanted to say that i'm just, uh my work question is talking about solutions um i want to get you guys opinions on like legislative things that can be done like of course you can you can talk about racism in america but like i feel like if you don't talk about the legislative side it's really only like maybe half the issue or I'm just wondering what you guys think about that. You guys have any opinions on that? I I have a brief um, answer to this because this is what I say um, to people that I encounter who vehemently are about like Kimmy was saying, and that I mentioned before about ending racism, like really believing that, that it can be done. And, and it's actually coming from a place where it's good because they don't want people to be harmed by racism. But I try to tell them, like Kimmy said, well, if we end racism, what's the next thing? Are we going to end greed? Are we going to end, you know, evilness? Are we going to end murder? Like, you can't end racism. That's a choice. Um, the best thing that we have is legislation, bills, and laws to be in between people who want to do harmful thing with their racism. That's all that we have. Um, I advocate for that. Um, I'm not like a pro. I, Lee actually is in with the legislation and bills, and he's often Lee like um, updating updating me on this knowledge. But that's the number one thing that really can combat racism is is laws and policies um, to be in place. Um, but yeah, that's. Your point is exactly right. Lee, do you have something to weigh in? Because you're often Lee, always talking about Lee, laws no, and policies. I, and stuff. I, I would, uh, I guess I would say that, you know, we, Brittany and I talked about this a couple of days ago. Um, but the, you know, the education stuff is one of the things I think is kind of 
interesting with the, um, you know, I, I really do believe, and this is a, a belief that um, when I think of the United States and how well it's progressed over time with technology and all that kind of stuff, I think the reason why we've done so well is because the overall, you know, our public education system was, was really, really good. And I don't think it's there now like it used to be. And I, and I think that, um, you know, the money is the way it's set up. And then again, this was set up on purpose, you know, the way it was. I mean, our schools are funded by property taxes. And if you live in a good area, you can have good schools. And if you live in a bad area, your schools might not be as good. And that's, it's literally, that's the way it's orchestrated, right? Now, where Brittany and I live, there's only one school district. So all of us, all, you know, all the kids from here get to go to the same school with the same stuff, which is awesome. You know, I mean, that's, that's the way it probably should be everywhere. But I know it ain't that way everywhere, even though I haven't lived in those other places. You know, I know that they're, that the schools are not uh, like, you know, set up like that, where it's, um, you know, where the funding is there to ensure all the, you know, all the, the same opportunities, you know, for, for everybody, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's just not like that. You know, we live, I would think in a somewhat rich society, wouldn't you say, Brittany, our community is, you know, we have yeah. a Fortune 500 company in our, in our town and, and they have made the schools really nice, you know, and mm -hmm. that's great. And it doesn't matter what, what race you are in Columbus because we all live in the same community and all the property taxes fund all the schools equally. But I know that that's not the case everywhere. And it's definitely historically not been the case, you know, and, and, you know, I, I, I really do feel that um, some of the legislation now that, you know, the, the voucher stuff, and I understand some of that, but I mean, if you take, if you're taking money away from the public schools and you hurt those inner city schools, you're only hurting the country in the long run. I think when you do that, I, that's what I really feel. I, I think education is the key to, to, to just about anything in a way. And, you know, right now, you know, we, you know, part, you know, we have legislation that literally is doing that, you know, mm -hmm. under the guise of, you know, choice and whatever the, whatever the thing is called, you know, to make people feel better about it. But, but in the, but in, in the end, at the end, there's plenty of people who don't have a choice and their school needs to be just as good. And I, I mean, if we really want the best, you know, what, what's best for the country, a great, great education system is one of them. I think that we could, we should all want that, you know, mm -hmm. get set up to do that right now. And I think it just got worse. Mm. Well, um, my girlfriend is the one who put me onto this chat. Her name's Emma and she's like really big fan. You guys see she has Hi. Hi, Emma. Hi. Um, I have, I don't want to take up a ton of time. So I just want to say uh, I was super excited when I heard that you all were going to have a conversation. Um, I really appreciate your perspective. Listening to you gives me the same feeling of when I'm listening to like Angela Davis or Cornell West is just very hopeful. Um, I know that's a, like a big. <laughs> that's <a> huge. <laughs> um, I guess I do have a, a quick question if that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, you know, like he said, we're from Tulsa, Oklahoma. This is the hundredth year of the Tulsa race massacre. Um, and over the past few years, I feel like animosity between particularly white people and black people in the city has grown. Um, we're still very segregated in Tulsa and mm -hmm. it affects relationships, obviously, like relationships we're even able to have. Um, so I, particularly between white women and black women, I feel like there's a lot of animosity and I just wanted your perspective on how, like, you know, isn't my place to initiate that conversation is, should that be a conversation that needs to be had? Like the historic betrayal of black women by white women, you know, I just feel like that's not talked about a lot. I kind of wanted your perspective. Do you, are you saying like, is it your place to initiate a conversation on that or just initiate a, just a regular conversation with them? Uh, I guess isn't my place to initiate a conversation on both, I guess, both. I think the latter would just be more organic to just, you said that there's tension specifically between white and black women. Um, why is it just between them? Like, what, what's um, the catalyst of that? To me, I feel like it's kind of the lingering effects of, you know, like 
the Tulsa race riot. Like, you know, it was okay. a white woman that caused mm-hmm. it, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. by accusing a black man of, you know, doing something he didn't do, mm-hmm. which, you know, obviously precipitated the burning of Black Wall Street. So I feel like it it's my responsibility to reach out, but I, I'm not sure how, <laughs> I guess. I would say not to reach out on that note because n- not yet, not until you gain some type of rapport with a person where you can sure. dive in that kind of conversation. Because I know I can, I love to discuss really anything, but um, I'll just say this, for example, I had a couple of friends who, who I had not talked to in years who, when George Floyd died, that was when they texted me and was like, they even text me about George Floyd, but I knew what they're, they're saying and asked me how I was and all this. And I'm thinking, you want me to give over my emotions right now to you on your call. Like that's not that's fair. Hard. So yeah. what you, and you're coming from a great place and you're asking the right questions. I would start with just opening up the conversation even if you got to just start smiling at people, if that's what it takes. Yeah. And then you might see that person again, they might smile at you and then you smile. I don't know how small your town is, but then just start an organic relationship in that way, a friendship to where they know where you're coming from to where you can really deep dive on these conversations because they already know a sense of who you are. That's the best way to do it. I talk to you if you did that. I'd be like, let's talk about it. Yeah. So yeah, I don't know that if Kimmy good. wants to try. That is so good. I just want to say, like, I second that fully. Um, and I want to say, don't be afraid of. Don't only show kindness when you expect someone to be kind back. Like, sure. if we give a simple example of walking down the street and someone's coming, and you sense that moment of like, oh, we're gonna cross, and then like she's gonna give me the eye. Just know that you can be kind and. And it's okay if they don't take it. Like, I think that breaks that tension rather than being, let me wait to see if she's friendly before I smile at her. Just be Mm -hmm. like, hey, I love you regardless. Like, I love you unconditionally and you can just like continue. And that's something that I think speaks to what Brittany is saying is just be be organically friendly um, and don't fear the pushback. If someone's like, oh, she was trying to be friendly. Like, I'm not gonna like, you know, just accept that that might happen and love regardless. Yeah. It'll come to you because you have a good heart. It'll you will get that back. So yes, I would love yeah. to know if it does happen. Let us know in some way. Email me and um, <laughs> and if you need more questions, you can email me. It's on my channel. So yeah, thank you for asking that because I'm sure there's people wondering that too in this chat yeah. um, and and viewing this. So thank you. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm going to quote Kramer on this one. And say I got nothing. <laughs> don't mind him <laughs> but thank you guys so much for tuning in we appreciate yeah. you and the support thank you a good one. bye bye hi guys hey, hey wow there's still a lot of people watching you guys are ogs i don't know what's going on in that chat <laughs> but there's a lot of comments and i'll read i can't them later. see it anymore but it's, it's yeah, yeah it's it, went, still- it went away it went oh, away wow. okay. okay well um guys thank you so much for doing this this was i guess the first official live stream i'm gonna do many more if you didn't get a chance to come on you will because these will continue to happen i appreciate all of you um kimmy thank you so much for this talk and being so transparent and so open and then answering all the questions like i didn't know it's going to be this long but this is great actually this was amazing thank you Brittany. like oh my goodness blessings to you lee thank you like this set thank me free guys. even more so i'm so <laughs> grateful I'm like, and on a sunday hallelujah hallelujah all right Come on. well thank you for tuning into american shade if you didn't catch this live stream i will post it tomorrow peace love less shade and love and respect each other bye I thought she'd cut the live and maybe not.